All right. I think we're ready to get this show on the road here. Good morning and welcome to the third event in our 2022 Alaska Sustainable Energy Conference virtual workshop series, Hydrogen in the High North, sponsored by the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. I'm Gwen Holdman, the director of the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. Um, ASAP is an applied energy research program hosted or, or organized at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. It focuses on research for Alaska's communities and industries. But one thing that we do in addition to our research is really um, finding opportunity spaces or creating opportunity spaces for sharing information about emerging technologies and strategies that are relevant to Alaska now or in the future. And also connecting Alaskans with some of the projects and the technologies that are being developed nationally or internationally. And so this workshop is an example of that. It's the third in a series of four workshops on topics leading up to um, the in-person inaugural Alaska Sustainable Energy Conference hosted by the governor of the state of Alaska and taking place May 24th to 26th at the Nina Center in Anchorage. We'll share more information about that later. We selected the topics for these four workshops because they represent areas that are of timely interest to Alaska and also subjects that deserve a little bit of a deeper dive than will be possible during the Alaska Sustainable Energy Conference. And I'll admit that personally, this is the workshop that I've been most excited about. And part of that is, to be honest, I've been a little bit of a skeptic about the role that hydrogen can play in global energy transitions in the future. Um, hydrogen is something I had a little bit of an opportunity to dabble with as a young engineer myself early in my career. So I have a pretty, pretty good understanding of some of the complexities and challenges of using hydrogen directly, um, either directly or as a carrier fuel. Um, but I do know that the technology and the opportunity space have evolved a lot since then. And I'm looking forward to taking another look at what this option could look like for Alaska and look like globally. So from our perspective, this workshop really just represents an opportunity to start this dialogue um, related to hydrogen. Um, we are using this as a platform and an opportunity to announce the formation of the Alaska Hydrogen Working Group. Um, this, this is a new working group that we're forming with a goal of migrating some of the questions and opportunities for action that we discover together in the next couple of days to a more permanent platform for information sharing and collaboration. There should be a link in the chat that directs you to a sign-up page for the working group. We'll provide more information throughout this workshop, um, but that includes a draft charter that'll be formalized by the members of the working group. It's a group that's open to the public. It's an informal um, group, including non-Alaskans that are interested in Alaska and Arctic energy issues. So please, if you're interested, sign up for that, um, for that group as a way to stay engaged after this workshop ends. So with that, um, to kick off this workshop, I'd like to introduce and welcome Curtis Thayer, the Executive Director of the Alaska Energy Authority, to share a few remarks. Um, AEA, the Alaska Energy Authority, and ASAP have been long collaborators on addressing energy um, issues for Alaska communities, and we appreciate their longtime support and partnership. So thanks for joining us today, Curtis. I'll turn the floor over to you. All right. Thank you, Gwen. Um, as, as she mentioned, I serve as the executive director of the Alaska Energy Authority, and I want to thank you for tuning into this week's work, this week's workshop on to explore hydrogen opportunities in Alaska. AEA has long enjoyed a long, productive partnership with ASAP, and we are pleased to be part of this discussion as a, leading up to the first sustainable energy conference hosted by the governor in, in, in May. And I believe later today we'll be also hearing from the governor. A little bit about AEA. AEA is the state energy office and lead agency for statewide energy policy and program development. Our mission is to reduce the cost of energy in Alaska. There are several ways that we go about doing that. Uh, we're involved in power generation and transmission on the rail belt, uh, which is the interconnected electrical grid from Fairbanks to Homer. We own Bradley Lake, which produces about 10% of the hydropower on the rail belt. Uh, we also own the uh, we also own 200 miles of transmission lines on the Kenai Peninsula as well as north of Anchorage, going into Fairbanks. And during the past year, last 20 years, AEA has designed and constructed more than 90 powerhouses all over rural Alaska. Most of these are diesel powered, although some primarily run on hydro and other are integrated with wind and solar. AEA's experience with design and construction of power generation, transmission, and district heating systems all over Alaska will prove valuable in analyzing potential for hydrogen, hydrogen production and storage. 
um, and transportation to address Alaska's energy needs. In the past, AEA has engaged in fuel cell analysis and deployment for over 20 years. A little bit later, you'll be having, I'll be hearing from uh, David Lockhart, who has been part of that for the last 20 years. Uh, and in 2004, uh, we partnered with the National Park Service to fund a five kilowatt propane fired solar oxide fuel cell at Exit Glacier Natural, uh, Nature Center. And, and it was to provide heat and power to that facility on a, on a seasonal basis. At one time, Alaska was said to have more fuel cells than any other city in the United States. I don't know if that's true today, but Anchorage has had two kilowatt, um, two kilowatt uh, at the National Guard Armory, 200 kilowatt uh, acid fuel cell at the YMCA, and two 25 kilowatt solid, solid oxide fuel cells at the Ted Stevens International Airport. A one megawatt combined heat power fuel cell at the airport post office that was operated by Chugach Electric, and it included four 250 kilowatt solid oxide fuel cells. At that time, one of the largest fuel installations in the world. In rural Alaska, which is primarily focused on diesel power generation with reciprocating engines, we completed a report on the potential for reducing emissions and improving efficiency on diesel inject in gensets by injecting hydrogen into the intake manifold. I believe AEA's potential to contribute to the future of hydrogen in Alaska is closely tied to our role in planning on the rail belt. AEA is a member of the board of the Rail Belt Reliability Council, which recently applied to the Regulatory Commission of Alaska to be the Rail Belt's electric reliability organization. The organization has been tasked with developing, among other things, integrated resource plan that will include energy storage, alternatives to natural gas, distributed generation, other technologies relevant to the hydrogen use. And uh, as the governor rolled out his infrastructure bill yesterday, uh, there's six million dollars for Alaska Gas Line Development Corp to work on hydrogen, and we have partnered with them to do that. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Gwen, and thank you very much for today. Thank you, Curtis, and thank you for reminding um, all of us of that long history that Alaska actually has had in, in working with fuel cells. Um, the predecessor energy research program at at um, the University of Alaska Fairbanks actually was pretty involved with a lot of that research working with AEA um, many, many years ago. And so it's, like I said, nice to sort of revisit um, a topic uh, that that has been of interest in the past and continues to be one today. And, you know, as you mentioned, um, there's some real opportunities coming up. Um, Alaska Gas Line Development um, ABGC is going to be a major partner along with AEA and ASAP. Um, the working group will be an opportunity and a venue for continued engagement um, related to potentially developing a hydrogen roadmap for the state of Alaska and ultimately um, looking at what an industry consortia could look like um, related to hydrogen development in the state. So we'll continue to fill folks in about that um, both here and in the working group in the future. So thank you. Thank and you. with that, I'm really um, excited to introduce our MC or our moderator for this workshop, um, Dr. Aaron Whitney. Um, Aaron's someone I've really had the pleasure of working with for, for many, many years. Um, she is one of our senior researchers at the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. Well, and, um, and she's the director of our solar um, technologies program. Um, she has a PhD in physical chemistry from University of California or <laughs> University of Colorado, sorry, Erin in Boulder. And she actually joins us from Germany today. Um, I guess technically it's nighttime for you. Um, she's in Freiburg as a visiting researcher embedded at the Fraunhofer Institute as a Fulbright scholar, um, where her Fulbright, which she'll tell us a little more about some of, is centered on better understanding opportunity spaces for using hydrogen for long duration energy storage to support the integration of variable renewables like solar um, in remote communities. And so she's actually just kicking off her work over there. She's been distracted a little bit by all of the long hours she's been putting in um, into being the primary architect of this workshop. And anyhow, I think she'll give us a little more insight um, into her interests and hydrogen and background on that and a little bit more of what we'll expect over the next couple of days. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Erin Whitney. Thank you so much, Gwen. I appreciate the kind introduction. Uh, we are excited to welcome all of you today and tomorrow for a workshop full of interesting and stimulating sessions uh, and materials. This series of four workshops is being held monthly as two half-day Zoom sessions free of charge leading up to the Alaska Sustainable Energy Conference, which as Gwen mentioned is happening in person 
May 24th through 26th at the Denina Center in Anchorage, Alaska. The first virtual workshop, uh, Nuclear Energy in Alaska, was held in February. Following that, um, we had the Ocean and River Energy in Alaska workshop in March. And our fourth and final workshop, entitled Electrify Everything, will be held in May. Uh, so please visit www.alaskasustainableenergy.com to register uh, for any of those, as well as the uh, May workshop. So our third work workshop here today, Hydrogen in the High North, uh, Decarbonizing Fuels, will include presentations from several speakers who will be sharing their knowledge, expertise, and experiences in the hydrogen field over the next two days. We are truly excited and honored to have them with us. Uh, there is a ton of hype about re hydrogen recently. And the purpose of this workshop, as I've envisioned it, and I'm really grateful to many of you for your input along the way here, is to dig down into some of the large and small questions about its role in the energy transition, and especially some of the challenges and opportunities for Alaska. We are going to dig into questions like, what is happening with hydrogen elsewhere in the nation and the world? What are the economic policy and technology drivers and constraints for its implementation in the Alaska context? Uh, we are going to ask ourselves about regional or scale considerations related to its adoption, and also explore whether Alaska could someday export hydrogen as an energy commodity. My own interest in hydrogen stems from a desire to figure out uh, long-term seasonal energy storage solutions for Alaska's communities. Although I will admit I've come to learn that hydrogen is about so much more than that for our state and our nation and our world. Um, and as Gwen mentioned, I'm over here in Germany right now. I'll be up late into the night as you all, most of you are starting your day, although we have speakers uh, from Europe as well joining us today. So to that end, we have tried to include a little bit of everything along with some engaging discussion uh, in our sessions. We will start with some technical policy and economic overviews this morning, followed by some really exciting Alaska relevant use cases uh, for hydrogen technologies that I hope will pique your own ideas and observations about what may or may not be possible in Alaska. Uh, tomorrow, we'll start back in with a synthesis of today's use cases. So make sure you get back on at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Um, and then we will follow that by a panel discussion on hydrogen carrier fuels, uh, remarks by Dr. Sunita Sachipal, head of the DOE Hydrogen Office, as well as our Governor uh, Dunleavy. We've got some interactive and dynamic synthesis sessions planned tomorrow with some of Alaska's most colorful personalities. And finally, a panel led by the Department of Energy, Arctic Energy Office on external partners and opportunities. So it's all going to be good and we hope uh, you can join for as much as possible over these two days. So looking forward to our time together today, you can see our agenda up on the screen for the daily program overview. And this is, you can see some of the individual speakers and topics uh, that we have. Um, as I mentioned, we'll start out with some basics and then we'll move into the use cases, everything from long-term energy sources, storage to stranded resources to carbon capture, uh, hydrogen for buildings and heat, and then even some green hydrogen presentations. So it will be really excellent and hopefully very thought provoking. So we have got some engagement polls to make sure everyone is comfortable with their Zoom platform and operating um, on all cylinders this morning. Um, so let's take a look at where all of our attendees are joining us from today. We would like to know where you're signing in from. Um, to participate in today's polls from your computer, go to pollev.com forward slash T-O-T-T-A-K 216. We recommend using Google Chrome for the best results. And the link to the poll is also in the chat. Or if you need to participate by phone, you can text capital T-O-T-T-A-K-216 to the number 22333. You'll receive a text message once you've joined the session. Type and send your response and the results will pop up on the next screen. So for this first activity, all you need to do is drop a pin on the map to show us where you're joining from. So let's see here. I am seeing lots of Alaska. I am seeing the Pacific Northwest. I'm seeing California. I'm seeing whoo, Central America. 
I'm seeing the East Coast. Um, do we have anyone from outside the United States? I see someone way far up north. Looks like in Canada. Oh, and I see someone in the Middle East. Very exciting. All right. This is wonderful to see. I see many more folks joining us from looks like the Great Lakes region, East Coast of the United States. This is great to see um, all our folks joining us from today. All right. Wonderful. Okay. If you had trouble with that poll, we've got one more chance for you to warm up this morning. Now we would like to know what sector do you represent relative to hydrogen opportunities in Alaska? Are you with industry? Are you with academia? Are you with the government? Are you with a national lab? Are you a community member? Um, again, to participate, go to polleb.com forward slash TOTTAK216 or on your phone, text capital TOTTAK216 to the number 22333. And it looks like our event coordinators are populating a beautiful word cloud. We have lots of industry, or at least that's the biggest one. We've got academia. Oh, someone is from the future. That's very intriguing. <laughs> someone is free. Uh, university, transportation, nonprofit, contractor, codes. So I can see that we have a diverse cross-section of stakeholders and interests today, which is just wonderful to see because um, the purpose of this is to bring all voices together, just like there are lots of colors of hydrogen, uh, there are many viewpoints and approaches and options and opportunities in this um, uh, growing industry. And we want to have everyone at the table. So this is wonderful. Thank you. All right, government loud and clear. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay. I am going to go over just a few housekeeping items here. Um, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know your name and the organization you're from and that can scroll through. People can get a sense of each other there. Um, our presenters have created presentations as engaging as possible. So please continue to participate in the polls, submit your questions via the chat, um, or the Q&A actually, and join in various activities that our presenters have planned. If you are having any difficulties whatsoever with the audio or trouble viewing the presentation, please send a direct chat message to event support. So if you go up under participants, or maybe it's actually under panelists, um, look for event support there, uh, and they will be in touch with you directly to help you out. Um, also, during the workshop, all attendees will be muted. Uh, you may submit your questions or comments, again, by using the chat feature uh, or our Q&A, and our moderators will read the questions to the panelists at the end of each presentation or panel, depending on how it is structured. Uh, the recording of this workshop will be available on the Alaska Sustainable Energy Conference website uh, at www.alaskasustainableenergy.com forward slash virtual dash workshop. Um, at a later date. So just please continue to check back for more information. Uh, and we are so happy that you are here with us live today. And once again, I also wanna reiterate Gwen's invitation to go check out the hydrogen uh, working group page that we have set up. That is asep.uaf.edu forward slash hydrogen. So before we kick things off, I'm just taking a breather and making sure there are no questions in the chat or other comments. Okay, we are running ahead of schedule, which is great, and brings us to the first session of today, uh, The Hydrogen of Hydrogen. Um, I will take credit for that title, so if you don't like it, you can uh, have words with me later. Um, session one will include four presentations with time for questions uh, after each speaker, just some brief questions. Uh, we will set the stage this morning by providing some brief high level technical and economic overviews, uh, global and Arctic insights um, and statewide efforts and opportunities moving forward. 
I am going. To, I will give just a quick introduction to all of our four speakers, and then we'll move through the speakers um, without introductions in between each one. I will kick things off uh, with a technical overview, uh, and we'll follow that by uh, a presentation by economist Steve Colt. Steve is a research faculty member at ASEP where he is leading ASAP's current study of decarbonization pathways for the Alaska Rail Belt Grid. Uh, prior to joining ASAP in 2019, he spent 30 years at ICER, the Institute of Social and Economic Research at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Um, he has worked for the Public Utility Commissions in Maine and California and has a long focus on energy systems, as well as rural electricity and sanitation and, and other topics. Following him, we'll have Dr. Julia Neshawat from the Atlantic Council. Julia is a recognized expert for energy, environment, climate change, and national security issues uh, as a public servant, academic, former military officer, and U.S. diplomat. Um, she is now a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council and has served as commissioner on the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, reporting to the White House and Congress on domestic and international Arctic issues. Really excited to have Julia with us. And then following Julia, we will have a presentation uh, from Nick Simoniak with the Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation, highlighting some exciting efforts and opportunities um, for hydrogen in the state. Nick is the manager of new business ventures for the Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation. Under this role, he leads, leads AGDC's commercial efforts to partner with industry leaders to develop and finance the Alaska liquid natural gas project. He has previously led efforts to develop Alaska natural gas projects while at the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority, as well as NSTAR. And he has also worked for Alaska private investment firms. And I will add that uh, Nick is a proud graduate from the University of Alaska Anchorage, where he obtained both his BA and, and BA, uh, a BA in economics. So great set of speakers and I, We'll kick things off here and get mine out of the way first, which is always the best position to be in. And then we will head over to these folks. So, okay, I am going to share my screen here. I am going to give a super speedy um, overview of uh, the technical fundamentals and considerations for hydrogen um, to ground us all as we start to think about the opportunities and challenges for hydrogen in Alaska. Um, and then we'll get, up, get on to the fun stuff um, and all the use cases and the economics and policy after that. So I have three um, chemistry slides and I promise, uh, because I am a chemist, uh, we have to have a few, but there will only be three. Um, so just to start at the very beginning, uh, we will primarily today be talking about hydrogen, methane, and methanol, although I'm including um, the wide variety of long chain hydrocarbons uh, because these are what we talk about when we talk about fuel. Um, and not shown here is uh, ammonia, which is nitrogen uh, with three hydrogens. And what we're concerned about here is uh, that bad boy in black, that's carbon. And uh, Hydrogen is different from those because it does not have a carbon. Um, when these car, um, hydrocarbons are burned with oxygen, they create carbon dioxide that contributes to global warming and has consequences for our planet. Um, hydrogen does not have that carbon. That's why uh, it has um, such promise for its use. One of the drivers for this conversation that we are having about hydrogen today is um, global greenhouse gas emissions. And when you look at these emissions by economic sector globally, you start to see the impact um, that hydrogen can have. Hydrogen has the opportunity uh, to impact a couple of the major sectors, including electricity and heat production, either mixing hydrogen with natural gas for produ power production or replacing natural gas altogether, or for other applications that we'll hear about today. Um, it also can impact the industrial sector, especially in the steel and cement industries and other chemical industries, which intensively, intensively use uh, hydrogen. Um, 
or need a high, high heat for which hydrogen can also provide that. And then in the transportation industry, we're already seeing uh, shipping players like Maersk uh, propose methanol ships. And we're also seeing entry into this scene uh, by the aviation and uh, automotive industries. This is uh, just another display of that pie chart that I showed uh, just before here. Again, you can see those sectors of the transportation applications, you can see chemical and industrial applications, you can see the power and heat applications. And we're showing existing applications as well as those that are coming online. Uh, and then this fourth column here is where things get juicy and interesting, integrated hybrid energy systems. And I think this is where there's lots of jockeying, there are a lot of ideas and, and no one quite knows which way uh, it will all go. The density of hydrogen is also low relative to other fuels. Um, so if you look at the large graph, not the inset graph, um, you'll notice that the density of hydrogen, which is a volumetric property, is, is really low uh, compared to uh, hydrocarbons and especially diesel. Um, and this is why diesel and oil are in such high use today. You know, they make a lot of economic sense. We get a lot of bang for our buck. Uh, it, it, it pencils out. Um, and you can see here that at least volumetrically, the density of hydrogen is really low. And this impacts the economics of hydrogen. However, if you look at this inset graph, the specific energy of various fuels, and this is by mass and by weight, hydrogen really takes the cake. Um, I, I realize there's a green bar and a blue bar, bar there, and those are differentiated by the heat of vaporization. It's really not important for today. But what I really want you to take away is that the specific energy of hydrogen is quite high. So for applications where weight is a consideration, hydrogen wins out. So just something to think about as we're thinking about different fuels and their properties. Um, liquefying hydrogen is also an option. And I like this graphic because it shows just the, the sheer difference, two orders of magnitude um, in the, the volume difference between liquid volume and, and uh, gaseous hydrogen. Uh, it's huge. And we just saw the difference in those properties. And it starts to make you think about the different factors involved in using and moving and storing hydrogen uh, in these different forms. Hydrogen also has some interesting combustion properties. Um, hydrogen has a really wide range of concentrations over which it's flammable. So from about 4% to 75% uh, concentrations, it's flammable. This compares to methane, where if you get above about 15%, it's not flammable. Um, this makes it challenging to deal with. Um, hydrogen also burns at a hotter temperature. It has a faster flame speed, meaning that the outer edge of the flame in a combustion process moves more quickly. And these, these are all considerations that go into uh, thinking about how we handle hydrogen, how we might retrofit facilities to, to use hydrogen. And I think it's good just to keep these things in mind as we're thinking about different fuels and the pros and cons. We also hear lots about hydrogen colors. So I want to just make sure we, are, we know what colors we're talking about. Um, we hear about gray hydrogen, which is fossil fuels, usually uh, natural gas, where uh, the fuel source, again, fossil fuels, and we produce carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Um, we hear about blue hydrogen, and the difference there is that the carbon dioxide is captured. So we have carbon capture and storage. So we remove that carbon. And we'll hear a presentation today about um, carbon sequestration and that role and prospects uh, for that in Alaska. And then we have green hydrogen, where we do not have fossil fuel sources. We have renewable energy sources uh, that provide the energy for electrolysis. That's where we uh, split water to create hydrogen and oxygen. So, so those are the big differences there. But of course, it's never that simple. Um, I don't know if you've heard of pink, purple, or red hydrogen. That uh, is, is typically associated with nuclear energy. Um, we also have turquoise hydrogen, which is produced by thermal splitting of methane or methane pyrolysis. And instead of carbon dioxide, you just get um, carbon out. So you know, things that could be used for uh, steel or construction, tires, et cetera. 
Um, and then brown hydrogen is typically uh, made from coal and is typically much dirtier uh, than even, even gray hydrogen. Um, and I'll just mention that we will be hearing about uh, hydrogen from nuclear power today. And I realize it's in our green hydrogen panel, um, which maybe is not completely accurate, uh, but humor me there. And uh, again, just want to give a recognition to these very different uh, colors that we have and that people speak about. Today, we mostly have gray and brown hydrogen. About 60% of um, hydrogen is produced from natural gas um, without carbon capture and utilization and storage. Um, and then another 20% of our hydrogen is produced from brown hydrogen from coal. Again, the very dirty uh, production. And then uh, most of the rest is from uh, that turquoise hydrogen where we have methane pyrolysis and we have carbon as a byproduct. So just to give you a sense of where we get our hydrogen today, but that is that is changing for sure. And we'll hear about some of those prospects today. Um, this is the second chemistry slide. We took a break and we have two more to go. Um, this is, I think is interesting because it helps us understand the energy inputs and material inputs from different processes to make hydrogen. So what I'd really like you to concentrate on as you look at this slide is on the right side, the outputs for each of these three processes are a thousand kilograms of hydrogen. So the inputs are scaled such that you get a thousand kilograms of hydrogen out on the right side for each of these processes. So um, for steam methane reforming, SMR, uh, to get the same amount of hydrogen as these other processes, uh, you have to put in a fair amount of heat and you've got to put in methane. And besides getting hydrogen out, you also get carbon dioxide. Uh, you can see for electrolysis, again, to get that same amount of hydrogen, you've got to put in quite a bit more energy. So you can see there almost 40 megawatt hours as compared to five megawatt hours for steam methane reforming. But you've also got to use water and you've got to use more water. So, you know, again, that's a resource consideration. But you get hydrogen and oxygen out. And then for methane pyrolysis, you can see you know, similar quantities of methane and heat that have to go in. And instead of getting carbon dioxide as a byproduct, you get that carbon out as a, as a byproduct. So again, just some differences in the processes and we will hear more about these today. I wanna say a little bit about electrolysis uh, because it is a focus as we think about producing green hydrogen. Um, electrolysis very generally is using an energy source, uh, whether it's from the grid or, or something else, to combine with water, to split that water, to produce gaseous oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen is then dry, compressed, uh, and, and used in various applications. Uh, there are two primary types of uh, electrolyzers on the market these days, alkaline and proton exchange membrane uh, electrolyzers, um, solid oxides and anion cation exchange electrolyzers are more in the development stage. But again, that is changing so rapidly. Maybe it's, maybe it's different by now. Um, this is just a real uh, brief overview of some of the pros and cons. The alkaline electrolyzers have lower costs. Uh, but they're you know, a little bit slower in their response times. I put a picture in here from Scandinavia of a four and a half megawatt alkaline electrolyzer for a steel production pilot plant. So, you know, they're up and running, they're out there. Uh, PEM electrolyzers, um, you know, a little bit faster response time, uh, but again, reliance on uh, costlier, rare materials. So pros and cons for both. It'll be interesting to see how um, this landscape plays out. I want to just hit very briefly on a couple elements of the hydrogen value chain. Um, we've talked a bit about production. I also want to move on to delivery. You can see here, there's a couple different delivery approaches that encompass hydrogen. Um, the piped hydrogen is one, so think, think Texas. There's a hydrogen pipeline down there. Um, there's also uh, hydrogen that can be uh, carried by tanker or truck. 
I believe the hydrogen fueling stations in California actually have to have their hydrogen trucked in. Um, hydrogen can also be liquefied, uh, carried on ships, carried in trucks, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, of course, into you know liquefied carriers as well. Again, we'll talk more about those today, and this is just an overview. Another component of this value chain is storage. Um, you know, where do we store it? Uh, you know, before it's delivered, during the process, at the point of use. These are all things we have to think about. Um, hydrogen storage is typically physical based or material based. We'll be hearing about geologic storage today and those opportunities. It can also be stored as compressed gas. It can be stored as liquid. Keep in mind some of those. Uh, volumetric and energy density differences we talked about earlier. Um, it can also be material-based. Um, <laughs> incidentally, my postdoc back in the early 2000s uh, was on um, adsorbents for vehicular hydrogen storage. Uh, this was at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So that, that box that says um, MOF5, which stands for a molecular organic framework is similar to what I was uh, working on there. It's like, think of it as like a like Swiss cheese. And then you're basically trying to put hydrogen molecules into the holes of that structure and get it to store there as opposed to compressing it. So there's still lots of research happening there uh, and uh, lots of advances to be made. We also have to think about conversion in the hydrogen value chain. Um, and again, here's the last chemistry slide. When we're talking about conversion, one of the you know, most exciting things is, is thinking about using it in a fuel cell. The basic reaction here is you take hydrogen and oxygen uh, and you can release energy then as you uh, create just water as, as byproducts. That's what's happening uh, in a fuel cell to, to harness that energy. Um, this is a great graphic and I've tried to put resources here for anyone to follow up, um, and I can certainly send a copy of this presentation to folks because it's a lot of information here. But fuel cells are at the center of this conversion process. Um, and there are other uh, conversion, uh, other methods and applications as well. Uh, you can see some of the different energy sources that we've already talked about. Uh, but again, uh, multiple and versatile uses at the end of uh, that chain as well. I want to just touch a little bit when we're talking on uh, conversion and uh, automate, automotive um, applications because it's something that intrigues me a bit. You know, people say, oh, hydrogen cars or electric cars. And I think it's interesting to think about the efficiencies differences between these two scenarios. Um, you know, for electric cars, you know, we're thinking about an overall efficiency rate, you know, from energy production to, uh, to tank to wheel, if you will of 70 to 90%. In hydrogen, it's a lot less because of the losses in electrolysis and compression and transportation and fuel cell generation. Uh, and so, you know, it's, 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 it's probably pretty likely that we'll see hydrogen in sort of long haul transportation applications rather than say, you know, smaller passenger vehicles, at least in the short term. Uh, you know, things could always change. Um, another good way to think about this, I like this graphic too, um, is if you think about what's needed uh, to go 400 kilometers in a, in a fuel cell bus. Um, if you need 40 kilograms of hydrogen and it takes 50 or 60 you know, kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen, uh, you know, you'll need um, you know, a two megawatt electrolyzer running for an hour to produce that much hydrogen. So you can start to see sort of the trade-offs between hydrogen vehicles uh, and, and battery electric vehicles there, at least as, as things are currently standing. All right, and then finally, the applications. This is what we will hear more about this morning, and I'm really excited to hear all the presentations that we have on deck. Um, and then I wanna end with this H2 at scale diagram. I know many of you have probably seen it. And I remember when I first looked, saw it, it was a little overwhelming. So I've broken it up into parts so we can understand how these different pieces fit together. Because I think the hydrogen landscape, because there are so many options, can be really confusing. So we can start with hydrogen and all of its uses. And we've talked about these. You know, there's transportation, there's fuel, there's ammonia and fertilizer, there's industrial applications, there's heat and power. Um, that all makes sense. Then 
we can think about on the other side of the equation, the power grid and, and the sources that we have for our power grid, whether those are traditional fossil fuel sources or um, other types of renewable sources uh, or even other energy sources. And then the question is, is how do those interplay and how do those feed off of each other? So hydrogen can be used for power generation into the grid. Uh, we've seen that already. Uh, we can use fossil fuel sources uh, in our gas infrastructure to make hydrogen that then goes into some of those applications. And again, we've talked about uh, you know, using those fossil fuel sources with carbon capture uh, to make it cleaner. Um, and then let's see here, the middle part. And I think, you know, this is admittedly probably the mo most exciting part is this interplay um, with clean hydrogen. So using renewable sources to make hydrogen uh, that can then feed into all of these applications. So I really like this diagram. Again, it's only one interpretation, uh, but I do think it helps us sort of see the big picture. All right, and that's all I have got for today. And I will now see if I can navigate my own questions in the chat. Uh, and then we will go on to the other speakers. Thank you so much. All right, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, so we will go to the chat here. All right, someone else, the event support say, says they don't see any questions either. All right, it was crystal clear and <laughs> all of you are experts on hydrogen. Who are the current hydrogen users in Alaska? That's a great question. I'd like to hear from the users themselves. Well, if there were ammonia production, we'd have those hydrogen users. Um, I, I know it's used in uh, refining processes. Uh, so the fossil fuel industry certainly uses them. And there's probably others as well. Thank you, JR. Maybe the Marathon Refinery, yep. Okay, all right. Well, I don't wanna cut into the other presenters time. So I am now going to give the floor to uh, economist Steve Colt to talk about some of the economic considerations. Thank you, go ahead, Steve. Thank you, Aaron. I'm gonna try sharing. Okay, somebody, uh, Aaron, I'm seeing you, so you can give me a thumbs up if this is looking reasonable. It looks great, Steve, thank you. Okay, except I get a little instruction bar that obscures all the really important information. So uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I am no expert on hydrogen economics. So what you're getting here is the combination of a beginner's mind mentality with uh, maybe an old, an old workhorse uh, in the realm of trying to use basic economic principles to uncover uh, questions or concerns that we might have uh, really about any technology. And they used to say that uh, you can be an energy economist, or at least I used to tell my students, one of whom is Nick Tremoniak, and he can vouch for this probably coming up when he speaks. Uh, uh, they used to say an energy economist is someone who knows the difference between a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour. And well, that's not good enough anymore. In hydrogen land, there are so many more units that it's, uh, not good enough to know the difference between a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour. Now we've got uh, kilograms and standard cubic feet and all kinds of other pesky units. And I, I would suggest that a, a, a big problem with understanding hydrogen is just that the, the units are so various and so um, perhaps unintuitive that it, it makes it, I think it makes it difficult at least it's made it difficult for me to try to grasp some of these hydrogen economics. But here we go with the with my beginner's mind and my old theory. Now I need to advance the screen. I have only 12 slides, not including this one. Otherwise, there'd be 13. We can't have that. And I'm going to try to go fast and 
throw out some ideas that maybe we can uh, or uh, can percolate through the rest of today, and maybe even tomorrow. Uh, perhaps they're they're wrong, but in any case, my goal is to be very selective and hopefully a little bit provocative. If I'm not being provocative, then uh, I apologize. But uh, here are my four, four ideas that are gonna form the, the core of what I have to say in the next 10 minutes. And I have a little introduction and then a little surprise conclusion. But you can see what the four ideas are. I won't read them. I'll just uh, jump into the content here. So uh, when I approached the idea of trying to do some kind of overview about, about the economics of hydrogen, I felt uh, terribly lost and overwhelmed by all of those pathways and conversion uh, possibilities and interlocking energy systems that Aaron was showing slides about. And I got a really almost had a panic attack about how to characterize hydrogen. And, and then I realized that in fact, some of us in Alaska actually tried to do this um, was so long ago that I'd forgotten. So we had a little team that looked at uh, Galena and we looked at Galena in the context of a nuclear battery and the nuclear battery because it came in one size was oversized for the electric grid. So we looked at a hydrogen operation that could be run with excess nuclear energy. And this made the, the calculations simpler and it made, it made it easier to understand what the potential might be for an Alaska rural, in this case, hub community. So we had good engineers, not me, uh, who put some numbers on the capital cost of setting up a liquid hydrogen system. And this brings me to the first number. The first number we came up with was a number that you see a lot floating around in the, tech, the techno economic literature, which is the basically the, the capital cost of setting up your electrolyzer conversion system per kilowatt of input. And a, a number like 6,000 is ridiculously high relative to the targets that people are trying to aim for. You can find much lower numbers in the literature already, but they're for larger installations. So this looks really bad when you look at hydrogen from uh, trying to put hydrogen into Galena using sort of conventional metrics of what it would take on the capital side, even with free electricity. And sure enough, if you grind out the, um, grind out the, the levelized cost, I was covering it up, it was covered up with, you grind out the levelized cost, you come to another metric that is a very common metric in the in the global hydrogen literature, namely the levelized or annualized cost, levelized cost per kilogram of hydrogen. And we were coming up with four dollars. And that's really bad news if you're operating in the conventional space of the sort of global hydrogen scene where the target is routinely cited to be one dollar we're really gonna make headway with hydrogen. So it looks really bad when you try to put sort of hydrogen into a place like Galena with conventional metrics. But uh, in Alaska, we are not conventional, right? We are different. We have colder weather, we have all kinds of different things. And if you compare, uh, the 398 per kilogram, this is where the, the units are, are uh, difficult but worthwhile navigating. If you take your three, your $4 per kilogram of hydrogen and you change it to a energetic equivalent, turns out that if I did my arithmetic right, 
you're actually able to displace a gallon of diesel for $4.45. Well, that's not unrealistic. That's not an unrealistic price to beat in Alaska, especially in the last uh, two or three months. So the bottom line is we were out of the ballpark by conventional global metrics, but we're actually, we were actually in the ballpark in Galena in 2004, given the realities of the Alaska situation. So um, that's kind of a, a warm up intro to, I guess, one of my, one of my main points, not, not the four on the slides, is that we really are different in Alaska. And it's our differentness that I think is also attracting the interest of the nuclear vendors and other people who see that we have a, a rich target, if you will, of high priced conventional energy that hydrogen might be able to somehow displace. And just uh, to reiterate, in this case, the key, to the, the key to the displacement was we had an oversized nuclear energy source and so we had free electricity. But the, uh, the other thing, and this leads me to idea number one of four, is that the capacity utilization in that, in that uh, use case in Galena in 2004 was 100% because we were using an oversized nuclear energy resource and we could take electricity uh, in a base load way, and it was still free, and we could use that electrolyzer 100% of the time. <laughs> but that if, is not going to be the case in most real world situations. So this is, this is idea one of my four ideas, is that capacity utilization is really critical to these, at least the, the electrolysis, uh, green hydrogen electrolysis pathways and conversions. And one expression of this comes from the literature uh, where, where people are really starting to think about using, um, using hydrogen in combination with intermittent but zero fuel cost energy. And so the quote is right here for you to see, electrolyzer utilization becomes a key parameter. And to uh, really get into the weeds here, these guys started looking at how much uh, energy from a intermittent renewable resource would, would be um, excess to the load. And of course, at higher penetrations of renewables, like this green line is at 80% penetration, you have a lot more, uh, a lot more gigawatt hours of excess energy, energy without electric load to absorb it than you do at lower penetration. Anyway, the point being, you have to be really careful and mindful of uh, what kind of capacity utilization you're going to be able to get when you start pushing free or excess or surplus renewables into the system. And if you go back to the Galena case and say, well, what if we only had 50% capacity utilization? Well, then uh, things start to look a lot, a lot more dicey when it comes to displacing diesel. These are illustrative numbers. They're just intended to make the general case. Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip this slide because it just it's just drilling more down into this concept that capacity utilization of your capital is critical. And that was idea number one of four. Idea number two is uh, a kind of a very hopeful, optimistic point that we can achieve sort of hydrogen nirvana by scaling up all of the global components of hydrogen energy systems. And you can read this for yourself, but I guess the key point here is that the, the optimistic pro projections of what we'll 
what we'll get by scaling up are in the, are in the 60, 70, 80% range, but they're coming from what you might say is a, um, uh, a source with a viewpoint in this case. And so I have a couple of slides that just investigate this question. And uh, the answer that I come up with upon investigation is that, yes, it's not unrealistic to expect some dramatic improvements in the cost of, of uh, generating and delivering hydrogen if, if we get a dramatic scale up. Both of these uh, pictures are from the same report by the Hydrogen Council, so maybe you can take them with appropriate grains of salt. But um, the, the uh, top set of bars shows cost improvement due to, basically due to falling electrolyzer capital costs. But with the reason that the orange is higher than the green is because there's a, there's a significant cost of acquisition of electricity thrown in there. And so one way to read this one way to read this graph is that if we can start finding sources of free electricity, either because they're surplus or we have oversized uh, wind turbines or, or oversized nuclear resources or whatever, it starts to push the orange down towards the green. And that is sort of a, a secondary um, benefit of seeing this picture. The main point of this picture is that if, if the electrolyzer capital in particular comes down, we could expect to get very close to the magic dollar per kilogram of hydrogen cost, but not for a while. So uh, there is a sort of timing question of should we wait? for the cost to drop, or should we try to jump in, in to help it drop? And there you've got a little problem with chicken, chickens and eggs and uh, economic externalities. Nobody wants to be the one who pays a lot of money and then helps the cost to drop for everyone who comes behind them, especially if they're your competitors. But anyway, this is, this is just one example of how it's not unrealistic to see the potential for big cost drops. And this is basically if we can just get the cost of electrolyzers down, one component. Another way of seeing this, and this is the one that gives me a little more confidence that this, this scale, scaling up to drive costs down is real, is you can compare, um, if you have 10 minutes, you can read this graph, the key point I don't know if you can see my mouse circulating. Erin, can you see my mouse moving? Yep, I sure can. So over on the right, these are this is real data from the great wind and wind solar and battery cost reduction story. And so these are cost decline curves based on scaling up and learning effects, and they're steeper than the cost decline curves that these guys from McKinsey are projecting for hydrogen electrolyzers and fuel cells. So who knows, maybe we'll do even better than these kinds of colored cost declines that they're predicting if we get closer to the cost decline rates that we actually saw for wind, solar, and batteries. Well, I think there's something to this, scale up to drive costs down. Idea three, so we're, we're, we're more than halfway done because the last two are gonna go faster. Idea three is a back, back to basics, uh, Econ 101 idea. And that is the idea of a derived demand. We learn in Econ 101 that the demand for labor is a derived demand. And you can only hire people if they can produce profitable outputs. But it's true for energy also, and less, perhaps less appreciated. Energy is just one input to whatever it is you want. And this is a nice graph because it shows, it focuses on what they call the total, the total cost of operation or the total cost of ownership. 
And you can see that um, for something like heavy duty trucks, it's the medium blue here is the capital cost, not of the hydrogen part, but the capital cost of the truck. And for a bus, I think this is like a city bus, the capital cost of the bus is dominating the challenge of achieving economical mobility, not the capital cost of the hydrogen or even the distribution cost. And there's one other picture that I picked from this. There's a lot of these examples, but the other one I picked is lost, didn't make it. Sorry, there was another picture. Oh, sorry, it's on the right. So you can see it, I just couldn't see it. This is a European case where the climate is not so cold as it, as it is here. And the fuel component of heating your apartment, maybe Aaron knows this now already. The fuel component, according to this calculation is much less significant than the capital equipment. And if you're trying to retrofit an old apartment with a heat pump that's tied to a hydrogen system, you're looking at the capital cost of just retrofitting the end user's equipment is dominating the economic calculation, not the cost of the fuel, nor the cost of the grid upgrade for that matter. So I think this is a really important, um, me, it's a really important thing to keep in mind that we're not going to get big, big switches in the energy system uh, if we neglect all the capital equipment beyond the distribution of the hydrogen that might be needed to use it. Excuse me, Steve, so my I'm last idea, wrap go up ahead. here quickly. Yep. So I'm wrapping go ahead. up. The last idea is just that uh, once you start embedding hydrogen in all kinds of other aspects of the grid and its needs, uh, you get into a, uh, a real alder thicket of what we call joint production. And so they did this in Hawaii and I'll just, you can read the quote from the people at uh, Hawaii who tried it. And as they said, um, they're using their electrolyzer partly as a ramping mechanism for the grid, right? And so they can talk about the electrolyzer uh, serving as a grid helper while producing hydrogen on the side. And then they say almost as a throwaway line, or you could think of it as producing hydrogen while maintaining the grid on the side. And it's this, it's this question of, well, what, what's on the side and what's the main course that can really affect how you value price and decide about these integrated hydrogen systems. So I'm gonna jump directly to my conclusion. And the conclusion involves another slide, which we won't talk about. But look at all the capital equipment in this slide. This is a whiz-bang hydrogen system filled with expensive capital equipment. And I leave you with what is my conclusion about the challenge facing hydrogen, which is it's really all about the capital. You can do anything you want if you have tons of expensive capital. Here they've got a greenhouse with panels, storage, fuel cells, electrolyzers, batteries, inverters, and, and God knows what else. But you can also build a greenhouse without any of this stuff. So my conclusion that, that I wanna hear more about for the next two days is how can we be mindful of the fact that capital is scarce and expensive and it's really the capital equipment that's going to drive whether or not hydrogen uh, and get a real foothold in the energy system. That's it. Thank you, Steve. As always, that was very provocative. Appreciate your insights. I am actually gonna hold questions um, since we're running a little behind time. I appreciate everyone's comments in the chat and the questions, but we are going to go on to Dr. Julia Neshawat's presentation. Uh, Julia. You are up. I'm very excited to hear what you have to say about hydrogen in the Arctic. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Let me just bring up the slides here real quick. One moment. 
Okay, see everything okay? Yep, looks great. Great, thank you. Um, again, just wanna begin with thanking uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks and the Energy Center as well. Thank you, Aaron Whitney, for having me here today. I'm uh, calling in from rainy Washington, DC at the moment. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, it's such a delight and such an exciting time to be talk talking about hydrogen uh, today, now more than ever, with, with what's happening um, with energy diversification uh, worldwide. Uh, I'll give a little bit of a presentation and overview, uh, honing in more specifically on the Arctic region. Um, again, as I mentioned, it is an exciting time in the hydrogen world because it's already becoming a comprehensive part comprehensive part of the US energy mix, as we all know, where uh, already billions of dollars are being applied to further research in this field. Um, it's been a focus of dis discussion, again, across the world. You have China's hydrogen demand literally exploding over the past year. You have India looking to become a global player in hydrogen production. Uh, the United Kingdom recently launched its hydrogen strategy, also aiming to replace hydro hydrocarbon-based energy sources with cleaner energy sources. So you're seeing quite a bit of movement. Um, many of the, the, the current hydrogen and energy production uh, technologies are really, even though there's a lot of skeptic skepticism out there, they're likely to become more affordable, more scalable. Uh, I know we just heard about the economics uh, of this all, but uh, the scalability as well as, uh, as, of course, the energy efficiency uh, means in the medium term, that is. So while you know, at the same time, hydrogen looks to be important, uh, an important part of the net zero energy uh, mix globally, its potential, I would say, is especially exciting, particularly in low density communities and fragile ecosystems like the Arctic, uh, where the harsh effects of fossil fuel induced climate change uh, are most acute. So with that, let me uh, turn to the next slide here. Uh, so, as you heard in the earlier presentations and the overview of what hydrogen is, um, it's also already being produced as a byproduct of oil and gas exploitation. But we, if you think about it, we're literally surrounded by hydrogen everywhere. Um, so, despite, again, that skepticism, hydrogen has been the fuel of the future for decades now as we continue to talk about this. But, again, what's so timely is it looks like that future has, has finally arrived. Uh, which we'll talk a little bit about in the next day or two with, with uh, the feasibility. So as you heard a little bit uh, earlier by Aaron, um, hydrogen can be used in many ways, uh, transportation. I mean, you think about the new shipping routes with sea ice melting, uh, trains, cars, and of course, even airplanes. Um, in fact, I got to witness some of the, the automobiles, hydrogen automobiles in California, as well as in Japan. Um, but in the Arctic, uh, it's important to note, again, how it could potentially be used, particularly as a medium of storage that can subsequently burn and use to really to generate electricity and also hot water. So, again, hydrogen packs a lot more energy per molecule, which I think we all understand. Um, and having worked also with the Arctic Council, uh, you know, it's important to also look at how hydrogen can really run much leaner. And again, it can make it extremely efficient. Uh, at it, if you look at the various ratios, which you saw in some of the graphs earlier, um, it's hard to make a lot of power directly. So you take, for example, flame velocity, it's, it's, a, it's an advantage for hydrogen. You know, greater flame velocity, for example, creates a better ratio of air that can, be, that can burn quick, quicker. Um, but in the practicality of things, if, uh, you know, for example, in, in lab conditions, hydrolysis can yield as much energy as it puts in, um, and in particular to the Arctic, uh, with that practicality, that hydrolysis still needs a lot of work. Um, you have efficiency that drops, particularly in cold area, areas. Um, it's very electricity intensive and sometimes makes sense only in the context of electricity coming from renewable energy sources. There's uh, also been discussion of whether hydrogen could possibly be used to increase the efficiency as well as decrease the emissions from diesel fueled um, reciproc reciprocating engines, if you will. So looking, looking at all of that uh, will, be, will be key. Um, let's see, that was slide. Okay. Just 
one moment here. Let me make sure I've got it in there. Oh, and also I did want to we did want to add about the um, system concepts that are emerging where you see these electrolyzers, which again was talked earlier. It can be used as uh, dispatchable loads, um, generating and storing hydrogen that can then be used with fuel cells. Mm -hmm. um, or all hydrogen turbines as a complementary power source with uh, multi-source microgrids. Um, so again, you're seeing advanced hydrogen to heat systems that are evolving. In fact, I believe it's Norway um, and a, there a couple other nations that are deeply engaged in this kind of demonstration and refinement of hydrogen fueled uh, seagoing vessels. And there's uh, many more applications that are, that are in, in the work. Now, um, as you see here in this slide, I talk a little bit about solar and, and wind energy. I just think it's important really to emphasize that the high north, you know, as you all know, has long winters and high energy demand and smaller scale um, energy infrastructure. Uh, it, 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 it can make it, again, more challenging. So we have to you know, think again about what that feasibility uh, looks like when we're using uh, renewables as well. So. Hydrogen uh, can be used to capture um, that energy uh, and use it as needed, uh, despite some of the challenges with renewables. Um, there's a tension, as many of you may know, between using hydrogen and batteries as underground hydrogen storage is technically uh, challenging and difficult because it, it requires a specialized infrastructure to use, but lasts much longer and can be used any time um, as batteries you know, tend to lose efficiency faster. Uh, here you can see uh, it's it's really important to understand some again more of the practical applications and their benefits, particularly when it comes to, to heating in the Arctic and burning hydrogen. Again, extremely versatile. So energy intensive far northern living makes certain hydrogen and good storage an actual viable choice. You know, you, can, you, you continue to follow the energy markets, you follow the energy demand patterns, the constant need for heating, the lack of sunlight many months of the year that causes this type of disequilibrium. You know, hydrogen can actually fix this. Hydrogen being, again, water intensive and the high north being water rich is also another further uh, incentive, if you will. So opportunities for the Arctic. Uh, you know, there. I think there are certainly now more than ever clear dimensions for the Arctic. Uh, you heard in Aaron's presentations earlier the different types of hydrogen, whether from black and gray and pink and so forth. Um, but again, it's 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 important to look at the reality of what can be possible. You know, today and and looking forward in the future. Um, so looking from the most realistic to the most ambitious. Uh, again, with the melting of, of the sea ice in the Arctic region, if you think about particularly, for example, the shipping um, area, that is certainly bound to increase. Uh, black carbon is, is a problem already, and it's, and it's certainly getting worse. If uh, ships were to be powered by hydrogen, which is worth noting, um, packs more energy per molecule than diesel, as, as I said earlier, um, fundamentally also less toxic. The Arctic ecosystem and the community and people within you know, this could certainly be a win-win situation. Um, so we can we can implement this now. Um, you got to look though. You know, small-scale options uh, for regions or villages where this might be tried out in practice and eventually scaled out uh, grid-wide. Uh, so just a, a couple pillars here that I wanted to, to highlight with regards to the economic incentives and so forth. Uh, Nothing will really happen without those economic incentives. So I think it's it's again important to note, uh, you know, hydrogen transition needs to be stimulated by uh, the state or appear at least organically. So you have to have that push and that support. Um, but it's it's certainly I think between my travels throughout Europe and and, and the United States, worth watching in particular what uh, the EU uh, will do, especially if you're seeing uh, gas decoupling and how that becomes. Uh, more real. In fact, I think it's over 90 countries now have hydrogen strategies. So I you know, welcome all of you to take a look at some of them. So you're, you're certainly seeing this clear need to actually implement at this point in time. Um, but again, it, it's a little bit of a mixture of the vision and the theories 
of success that are out there that I think needs to be marketed or advertised a little bit more. But again, undoubtedly, it is it is there and 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 ready to go. Um, I will say that that hydrogen certainly still needs uh, further research, uh, and that's great that we're we're doing this this workshop uh, today and tomorrow to to really highlight some of the the, the points here. Um, particularly, I think in the hydrolysis uh, area. Um, but again, the technology certainly needs needs to be scaled. So again, another interesting thing being in Washington DC, as many probably know, there was a bipartisan infrastructure deal that took place and it focused on hydrogen and providing the funding uh, that, that's needed. Um, you know, the EU, now more than ever, in fact, if you think of the Ukraine-Russia war that's that's ongoing, it, the Europe, Europe has a whole new perspective when it comes to hydrogen. Um, and again, uh, Norway, for example, recently financed um, the construction of two hydrogen powered cargo ships. Um, and Japan is also uh, in that process to, um, to use hydrogen for industrial purposes. So again, seeing, seeing quite a bit of movement um, from that standpoint. Uh, so I think you're all very familiar, uh, you know, again, if you look at Alaska's history, um, there's a great study that dated back from 1981 uh, that already considered small scale hydrogen projects. So here you have that. And then 40 years later, we're still sort of in that consideration phase, um, which I think can now be turned into the implement implementation phase. I think it was the, the great scientist Carl Sagan that said, um, you can only really understand the, the present and the future if you understand the past. So if you haven't seen this study, I, I highly recommend it. Um, and I can certainly send the link uh, offline. But it's great to see the, the Department of Energy as well as University of Alaska Fairbanks truly examining the production of, of hydrogen from ammonia. I know that's that's been ongoing. And again, this is different from the hydrolysis aspect, but but good to see that there's there's further research that's 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 been ongoing there. And then I'll just quickly close so that way there's time for Q and A. Um, you know, to me the bottom line is, you know, if we should soon have something to show for the for the high north, if you will, um, as the incentives are now probably the closest we'll really get to ideal circumstances. Um, you know, we really, I, I think at this point in time, have that green light when it comes to the economics, when it comes to the studies and the research and the feasibility of it all. Um, you know, you can argue that, yes, there's maybe some repurposing um, such existing technology that could take place to really address the needs of the fragile ecosystem and the communities, uh, particularly in the Ar Arctic region. And of course, it is essential um, to display really the viability um, to make hydrogen a reliable and efficient fuel. Um, you know, nowhere is this a, a better better place to be really to, to make a difference um, than in this, you know, fragile Arctic regions. And again, it, it, it will take advances in technology, uh, sweeping infrastructure development, as well as tough policy choices. Um, but I think the support uh, for hydrogen will certainly go a long way um, toward protecting the Arctic uh, region from the worst effects of fossil fuel burning, as well as some of those climate challenges. So with that, I, again, I thank you uh, for having me and look forward to any questions and, and hearing the rest of uh, today's discussion as well as tomorrow's. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. That was wonderful to hear that sort of global and Arctic perspective. Um, I am gonna keep us moving. There has been a request in the chat for a link to that 1981 study. Um, I would love to see that too. So I'll simply ask that, um, as we transition to our next speaker, that maybe you put that into the chat. Will do. Uh, if you don't mind. And um, thank you so much again. Uh, really appreciate your insights. You. All right. So without further ado, I am going to invite Nick Simoniak on board to talk about um, boots on the ground efforts here in Alaska. So Nick, um, here you go. I'm following your esteemed Professor uh, Steve Colt, a um, little bit of deja vu there. Go for it. Yeah, um, I'm just going to proceed and assume everyone can see my slides and hear me. Uh, but yeah, this is this is deja vu in a bunch of different ways. So Steve Colt, I forgot to mention in my bio that started my career at uh, ICER working for Steve Colt and uh, studied underneath him at UAA as well. Um, he mentioned that, uh, you know, to be an economist, you need to know the difference between kilowatt and kilowatt hour. I would say to be a good economist, 
you need to do unit conversions. And he kind of talked about that a bit. And, you know, I still use Steve Colt's principles for unit conversion, you know, as recently as last night with regards to hydrogen. Um, so jumping into it, I guess, you know, kind of the first question would be, why is someone from the Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation, uh, the state of Alaska owned uh, corporation created to monetize Alaska's North Slope gas and advance the Alaska LNG project? Why am I talking about hydrogen? Um, and the, the reason is, is that tomorrow's Asian uh, hydrogen and, and ammonia buyers are today's LNG buyers. And over the last number, just over the last year, two years, it's really started. Um, as we talked to those LNG buyers and LNG investors, uh, they began to more and more ask us about the opportunities for potential hydrogen, clean hydrogen or uh, ammonia, more likely, from Alaska. And what we discovered in those early conversations is that you know, for many of the same reasons that, that 50 years ago, the modern LNG industry was born right here in Alaska, uh, Alaska could also be the birthplace of the, the next generation, the modern uh, clean ammonia, clean hydrogen uh, global trade. Um, so for those who don't aren't familiar with Alaska's kind of history in the LNG space, the Kenai LNG plant down in Kenai, uh, operated by ConocoPhillips, was the first LNG export facility in the world created over 50 years ago, exporting cooking natural gas converted into LNG liquefied to Japan. Um, and, and it pioneered that, you know, lower carbon resource for, for, you know, multiple generations. And the reason why we think we could also be a future ammonia exporter is that those same natural gas fields, as well as the coal seams and the, the saline aquifers in Cook Inlet have been identified as the best carbon sequestration on the Pacific coast of North America. Addition, the short distance dis shipping distance to Asia makes us an ideal candidate for those early commercial cargoes. Uh, transporting ammonia, while it does not need to be as cold as LNG, it is a lot less energy dense, as Aaron mentioned earlier. So the relative shipping costs increase, so our sh short shipping distance is a commercial advantage. Um, additionally, the North Slope natural gas supply is uh, actually a very low greenhouse gas natural gas supply relative to other sources, say in Australia or the U.S. Gulf Coast. So if the purpose of switching to a uh, low carbon fuel like ammonia is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, it's important that the feedstock is also as low greenhouse gas emission or intensive as possible. Um, and, you know, the, the other reason, uh, kind of advantage we have is we have an existing ammonia plant. The nutrient former, formerly Agrium plant sits idle in Cook Inlet. Um, you know, nutrient is the third largest producer of ammonia in the world. So as, as us and, and the Alaska LNG team uh, we're looking to, you know, advance our gas line of the LNG project. We, you know, started exploring these, these opportunities to export ammonia. We really found out that over and over again, we kind of almost kind of uh, got lucky on all these characteristics. And as a result, right now, uh, I would say that we are one of the top candidates for uh, imports to Japan for blue ammonia. And kind of on that, I want to you know, mention one, one kind of aspect that I think the Department of Energy and kind of the United States as a whole really has a blind spot on. And Aaron showed a slide earlier where it showed, a, you know, the Department of Energy put out all the potential uses for hydrogen, right? Um, and exports was not on there. And it's, I think it's, um, we are really missing out if we only think that the decarbonization of the world's energy markets is going to be entirely domestic that all the energy produced and consumed is going to happen within national borders, uh, and that global trade of energy is not going to be a critical uh, component of the decarbonization of the world. Japan certainly knows this. Japan is probably the most aggressive uh, hydrogen or ammonia uh, plan in the world, and they have recognized they do not have the ability to produce even a fraction of their future ammonia needs, uh, and they're going to need to import that. So while Japan is ramped up entirely on looking for sources to import ammonia, uh, the United States and Department of Energy is just now becoming aware that the U.S. may be an opportunity to export those. So Aaron kind of talked about this a little bit, but I want to kind of talk a little bit more specifically about the energy exports. So like I said, for 50 years, we exported uh, natural gas, methane in the form of LNG to Japan. Uh, that natural gas through uh, reforming can be turned into a hydrogen and CO2 stream. That CO2 is re-injected to or sequestered permanently uh, in geologic formations, suddenly that hydrogen becomes a clean energy source. 
Um, but as Aaron pointed out, hydrogen is very volumetrically uh, undense uh, energy source. And to liquefy, it has to be, I think, 350 C or negative 350 C. So, you know, significantly colder than LNG. But if you convert it to ammonia, uh, it remains a zero carbon fuel because you replace that C with an N. Um, and it's be able to transport uh, much less expensive. So, you know, it's almost kind of a terminology thing. When we talk in the US, we talk about clean hydrogen. Uh, in Japan, they talk about uh, ammonia. They understand that they'll be importing it in the form of ammonia and either converting to hydrogen or combusting it directly as ammonia. So kind of the quick overview of, of what we're looking at here. So natural gas transported down the Alaska natural gas pipeline. So we build up the Alaska LNG project, which includes an 800 mile pipeline from the stranded natural gas resource in the North Slope to Cook Inlet. Uh, a stream of that natural gas in Cook Inlet would be reformed into a hydrogen or ammonia stream, as well as CO2. The CO2 would be sequestered in Cook Inlet, again, identified as the best carbon sequestration potential on the Pacific Coast of North America. And the hydrogen would be converted to ammonia and exported to Asia. So I threw a chart up on the right of the projected clean hydrogen market, which includes ammonia uh, produced by BP. And it, you know, without units, it shows that by, you know, 2045, 2050, the world clean hydrogen market is gonna surpass the current size of the LNG market. Uh, but I think almost in most, almost more important on this chart is looking at the early years. Right now, there functionally is no clean ammonia market. So a lot of the investment looking for, you know, the global clean ammonia trade is with the recognition that an industry will be created where there currently is not one. So funding sources. Uh, AGDC is, is, again, focused on the Alaska LNG project. We have existing funds that we use for the, that, that purpose. Uh, but we are also exploring alternative funding for to produce the hydrogen, you know, in, in parallel with the Alaska LNG efforts. So some of these funding sources include uh, private North American energy companies. Uh, the I'm going to skip over the infrastructure bill and come back to that. Private Japanese energy companies and and Japanese state entities. So we are actively talking with all three. I think in terms of maybe funding is uh, I think funding opportunities was the name of my talk. I'm not sure if funding is maybe the right way. Maybe funding slash investment. Uh, if you look at that hydrogen demand curve I just showed, it's going to require significant industrial investment, private industry investment into the space. And we are seeing that in the early stages right now, beyond just R&D, people positioning themselves for those large infrastructure investments and the billions of dollars to secure this future energy. Um, so probably the first generation will be a combination of private with some federal support. And, you know, the big federal support we're seeing right now is the $8 billion for hydrogen hubs in the infrastructure bill. Uh, it's, you know, as Aaron discussed earlier, AGDC has raised its hand to uh, be the state of Alaska entity to respond to the Department of Energy uh, funding requests for those hydrogen hubs. We recently responded to an RFI. Uh, we're working closely with ASEP to coordinate on a kind of a cohesive statewide approach. Um, and just recently, I think yesterday or the day before, uh, the governor released a bill seeking a, an appropriation for the state for AGDC to actually prepare that response to the hydrogen request for funding. Um, so again, that that bill is only a day or two old, and I'm currently sitting down in Juneau, so I'm not going to speak too much on it until I get fully schooled up on our marching orders. Um, but again, it, I think it's important to say that the world right now is not just looking for funding pilot projects and studies and feasibility. That industry is activated. There are investment firms out there raising billions of dollars in funds with the investment mandate to be in uh, low carbon fuels like hydrogen and ammonia. So I think we are, you know, right on the cusp of seeing uh, large private investment in the space. So want to end before I get to questions about tying this, this Alaska hydrogen opportunity in with the Alaska LNG project and, and kind of talk about where AGDC is at and how we're approaching the two. Because I think it's, it's important for the world to know and it's critically important for you know, us at AGDC to keep clear exactly what we're doing and why. Our mandate is to commercialize North Slope natural gas uh, and to provide uh, uh, low cost energy for Alaskans as well as revenue to the state of Alaska and jobs. So essentially advance this natural gas project for the benefit of Alaskans. So our primary focus remains on the Alaska Energy Project, transition it to private investors. Uh, we're making great progress. 
Uh, I'm very optimistic and confident we're going to move forward. A recent independent study confirmed that Alaska LNG has uh, a very competitive cost of supply to Asia. But because we have these natural advantages, which I you know, kind of refer to as dumb luck advantages, like the carbon sequestration, the shipping distance, the existing ammonia plant, we're also pursuing this, pursuing this hydrogen opportunity. And you know, maybe at the sanction of the gas line, we'll have a large LNG plant and maybe the smaller uh, nutrient plant turned back on. So the primary focus will be uh, the LNG exports. Because we have generations of natural gas supply, we know that we have enough timeline of gas supply to you know, maybe outlast LNG, whether that's 20, 30, 40, 50 years plus of LNG before we convert to low carbon, you know, uh, pure hydrogen exports from Alaska. Um, it's uncertain, but the way we see it and the term we use is future proofing, that if our investors put in the capital to uh, build the pipeline of the gas treatment plant on the North Slope and bring the gas to market, that wherever the market moves, wherever that demand for ammonia shows up in the future, whether it's you know, sooner or later, uh, they have the ability to um, switch from LNG to hydrogen at some point. And again, as we look to raise up to $40 billion in the next couple of years to construct the Alaska LNG project, and we go to those boardrooms of the private investors looking to make that investment, I think it's going to be critical in unlocking that funding to have a very coherent energy transition story. And we truly do have that with Alaska Hydrogen Opportunity. So there is, uh, as you might guess, uh, a lot of information packed in there and what we're working on, but I wanted to try to get through in a timely manner. Um, and answer any questions you have, and I'm more than happy to take any questions offline as well. Thank you so much, Nick. I'm just going to ask you one quick question and then ask you maybe during the break to go into the chat and answer some questions there. Um, just timing wise, what is the earliest possible date for having the proposed pipeline actually built and operational? Um, good question. So we would, you know, on the best the success case timeline, you know, we could sanction uh, construction in 2024. The pipeline itself has a two and a half year construction period. The other aspects of the project, including the gas treatment plant and LNG plant, uh, may have a little bit longer construction timeline. Uh, but it could be possible to see first gas uh, in maybe the 2027, 2028 time range. Um, but the, the full project completion would be a number of years after that. Excellent. All right. I do want to make sure everyone has a bit of time for a break. Um, Nick, I'll ask you to go into the chat maybe and just look at some of those questions and send some answers if you could. Um, lots of great information here. And thank you for um, pointing out my blind spot with regard to exports. I really appreciate it. We've got a timer going for the break. It'll be a little bit shorter um, than planned, but um, we've got wonderful presentations uh, up when we come back. So take some time for yourself, fill up your cup of coffee or glass of wine wherever you are, and we will see you soon. Thank you. All right, welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed our morning session. That was really exciting to hear those perspectives. We are going to dive right into session two, which will include a variety of presentations by external experts um, outside of Alaska. So this is a neat chance to learn about what's going on in the rest of the world. And those presentations will be followed by time for questions. We'll have a bit more time than we had this morning. So um, I'm looking forward to really having a chance to dig into those questions and have some good discussions, summarizing the challenges and opportunities in Alaska. Um, around these use case scenarios and involved in the making and moving and storing of hydrogen for these applications. Um, so I am going to introduce you to our first um, discussant who will be moderating our first three presenters, um, Mr. David Lockhart from the Alaska Energy Authority. And he will then go ahead and introduce our speakers. David has worked for the Alaska Energy Authority since 1994, managing the design and construction of bulk fuel tank farms, diesel powerhouses, and other energy projects. He has managed the Alaska's bulk fuel, geothermal, ocean and river energy, and solar programs. Um, you could just call him Mr. Energy. Uh, he received his <laughs> master's degree from mechan in mechanical engineering from the University of Wisconsin, and he is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Alaska. So David, thank you so much for uh, helping us out this morning and the floor is yours. Thank you, Aaron. Um, our first speaker is gonna be 
Robin Roche. He's with the University of Technology of Belfort Montbéliard. I'm going to try to get these pr uh, uh, pronunciations correct, but uh, I'm sure I won't get them all right. He, he's an associate professor. Robin received a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Technology of Belfort Montbéliard in 2012. He is currently an associate professor with habilitation at UTBM. He is the deputy director of the energy department and the chair of the microgrids group at the uh, FEMTO ST Institute. His research interests include microgrids, energy management, and sizing techniques, as well as renewable energy and storage, especially hydrogen and integration. Uh, I'll turn it over to Robin now. Yeah, thank you. The pronunciation was quite good. <laughs> so let me just share my screen. Um, so I've been asked to, to talk about uh, long-term storage uh, in, uh, in microgrids. Uh, so let, let me just start by, uh, digging into the, the terms first. So we talk about long-term. Um, this is a term that's actually not well-defined because uh, many people use that term, but sometimes they mean different things. So long-term can be from a few hours up to seasons. Uh, so there are just different considerations which have uh, implications on what we're really talking about. Uh, then, why do we want to have some long-term storage? And I will be focusing on the remote case, so uh, remote communities, for example. So first case, basically when the batteries are not sufficient, and this is a case you will, uh, you will face when you're looking at durations that are longer than some number of hours, four, six, 12, 24, 48, it depends. Uh, also, uh, for the time when you have long periods of low generation, typically low wind uh, uh, periods over several days, or a high load. Seasonal variations also of the generation and or of the load. And also in some cases for coupling with other uses of hydrogen. Uh, for example, when you have mobility, so you may want to refuel know, cars, trucks, whatever, uh, snow scooters also. Uh, so that there's plenty of uh, different applications we can think of. So once we say that, okay, how do we do long-term storage? <laughs> uh, th there's different technologies that exist. Uh, the most common one, and that is the one that's the most commonly used uh, throughout the world is pumped hydro. But for obvious reason, it's not applicable everywhere. Um, so uh, we may want to consider other technologies and hydrogen is one of them. So uh, we can do that using an electrolyzer tanks for storing the produced hydrogen and then using this, uh, this hydrogen in a fuel cell or uh, in a turbine. Um, so uh, let me just go through some, uh, some examples of, uh, of microgrids that have some applications of, of long-term storage. And I'm going to focus on first two different uh, projects that have been running for several years. So the first one is a microgrid that's located in uh, uh, a city called Mafat. Uh, it's on the island of uh, La Réunion. It's in the middle of the, well, not really in the middle, it's in, in the Indian Ocean, uh, close to Madagascar. So it's a remote site uh, inside of the island, which is a volcanic island. And access to this location has to be done using a helicopter or by walking for several hours. Um, so uh, the people there wanted to experiment uh, having a supply of electricity using renewable energy. So uh, this, uh, this microgrid was created and it supplies a school, a medical office, and also a forest office. And the design here was made to reach five to 10 days of autonomy uh, using the hydrogen so that uh, you can have a, a carbon free operation over this uh, duration. So the, the pictures you see are actually of this, of this microgrid. So on the right, you see on the top uh, part, you see the, the different buildings, at least some of them that are supplied by, uh, by this microgrid and at the bottom, you see the storage tanks and uh, some of the different devices 
So what are these devices? Well, PV panels, batteries for the short-term variations. And for the hydrogen uh, part, you have uh, a small electrolyzer as well as a fuel cell uh, in addition to the tanks, of course. So that's a project that's been running for several years. Uh, it's really a remote community that had little access to electricity and from all it seems they're pretty happy with, uh, with this uh, demonstration. Uh, so here you have a simple map uh, of, of this diagram. So I didn't translate everything, but I think this is pretty straightforward because most of the terms are the same, almost the same as in English. So on the left, you have the PV panels, uh, then different conversion uh, systems, so uh, power electronic converters. Then the hydrogen storage with the, uh, the electrolyzer, uh, the hydrogen tanks, the fuel cell. All of that connected to a DC bus with the batteries and then another conversion stage uh, that then uh, converts the DC uh, current to AC and supplies the typical load. So to the, the typical voltage that we have there. Uh, of course, they also uh, planned for having a backup diesel generator just in case, but uh, as far as I know, they're not using it. Second example, completely different uh, context. Uh, it's uh, somewhere in the French Alps at uh, 2.6 kilometers. Sorry, I don't know the conversion in in, uh, in miles. It's maybe less than two miles. Um, so uh, it's a refuge. Uh, so it's open year round in summer as well as in winter. In winter, it can host up to 47 people. Uh, mostly people that go skiing or trekking. Uh, the design of the system was made to reach up to 16 days of autonomy. Uh, it's also an almost carbon free operation, uh, except for a few short periods of time. And the, the system design is pretty much the same. You see, with PV panels, hydrogen, uh, also batteries, even though I don't have the exact specifications. So the small hut you see at the top is where the uh, hydrogen uh, storage is uh, is integrated, and the PV panels are mounted on the on the face of the of the building. Uh, another example uh, is something that's more recent because it's a research project we are currently working on. Uh, again, completely different location in French Polynesia, so in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, in this project funded by our research agency, which is the equivalent of the NSF that you have in the US, uh, we work on cogeneration, so that means producing electricity as well as cooling, uh, because it's a tropical region, so we don't really care about uh, heating. Uh, again, the point is to have carbon-free operation from PV, but here we want to reuse the heat, uh, the waste heat of the fuel cell, uh, so as to improve the, the overall efficiency of the system. Uh, so that's why we also have uh, thermochemical storage, which is used to gen uh, also generate uh, cold. So uh, in this uh, in this project, we're working on the scheduling uh, of the of the system, considering both the electricity and the thermal side, uh, and uh, it's currently being commissioned. Uh, so we hope uh, we'll be able to show some results in, in the coming weeks. Uh, so these are just some small scale examples and the, the next speaker will talk about uh, larger applications at the megawatt scale. But I want to talk also about the challenges of all that because yes, these are projects that are working. It's not at the scale of, uh, of entire cities as you see. Uh, so why? Uh, well, first, capital costs, obviously. It's, it's still pretty expensive. Uh, sizing is sometimes an issue, especially if you want to reach very high level of reliability. And by reliability, I mean carbon-free reliability. Uh, this has an impact. Uh, also, the management of this, uh, this hybrid storage, because you have very different time scales to deal with, from milliseconds to seasons, perhaps. 
uh, the volume of hydrogen, uh, because as you know, the hydrogen that you produce out of an electrolyzer typically has uh, is under pressure of about 30 bars. So uh, either you compress it, uh, which consumes electricity and is also pretty expensive when you buy the, the compressor, or uh, you leave it at 30 bar, but then that takes up uh, sometimes quite a lot of, uh, of space, uh, especially if you want to reach some seasonal storage. So hence, in some cases, uh, the need for underground storage. Regulations, which are quite complicated in some, uh, in some locations. Winterproofing of equipment, perhaps also, if it's not inside a, a heated building. The efficiency of the entire system, uh, but also, and this is something that's perhaps sometimes neglected, uh, the socioeconomic barriers uh, to all of that because of hydrogen uh, acceptance, which is not uh, always uh, very good, uh, and also the impacts of all of that on the economy, for example. Uh, so that's the main things I wanted to talk about in this very brief presentation. Uh, I'd be happy to, to answer any question you, you might have uh, on this topic. Robin, thank you very much. Uh, that was very clear and, and I, I appreciate uh, all the points you made, especially the, the last slide where you talked about some of the challenges. I don't know how much time you've had to familiarize yourself with um, conditions in Alaska. We have uh, over 200 villages that are microgrids in rural parts of the state. And uh, there's a lot of focus on trying to uh, address the energy needs in those locations because um, the people who live there struggle with the energy costs and, and they are some of the highest in, in the whole country. I'm wondering, uh, and by the way, the, the loads in many of those villages are in the range of 30 to 200 kW average load. And um, about 80% of the power is provided by diesel generators. And uh, the remainder is uh, wind, hydro, a little bit of solar. So I'm, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on uh, the appropriateness or the opportunity to apply the tech technologies that you have just described in rural parts of Alaska and um, using particularly wind. Uh, parts of Alaska have um, excellent wind, resor wind resources, especially on the, uh, the West Coast and in, in the Aleutian Islands. And we actually have uh, over a 20 year history of um, operating wind turbines. So we're, we're getting much better at it over time. So do you think Please, I was wondering if you could speak to the, the opportunities to use those technologies for um, uh, energy storage in, in microgrids like we have in rural Alaska. Yes, yeah, so I think it really makes sense when you start considering the fact that, and, and I think the next speaker will go in this direction too, uh, the fact that you can uh, use the hydrogen that you can produce for different applications. Uh, so that can be for long-term storage, as we just so, just so, but that's perhaps also for use with mobility, uh, perhaps some industrial processes where you might need uh, the hydrogen for whatever application. Uh, that can also participate in some ancillary services in some cases, even though it can be discussed in the case of a microgrid. So, uh, yeah, I think it can make sense, but again, the, the question of the costs is uh, is really important for, for everybody. Uh, so perhaps reaching 100% renewables is going to be quite expensive, but getting close to that uh, it is perhaps a good compromise. Uh, the exact number, I don't know exactly, but uh, at least it's going to, in the right direction. So, um, I'll you you mentioned cost and that of course is a major factor do you have any cost information about the projects you described i don't have anything that can be actually useful 
because these were uh, the ones you saw were from a few years ago and the price has significantly decreased since that time even for the last one that's currently uh, uh, being uh, tested in Polynesia uh, most of the equipment that we're using is not um, uh, large-scale production equipment um, I don't have any number in mind, but uh, even if I had these numbers do not represent what you could find at, uh, at on, on the shelf, basically. Okay, well, that's a good point. Thank you. Along the lines of what you can buy today, we have something um, in Alaska we call a procurement experiment. And it's kind of a test to see how available equipment really is. So in, in your experience, for the equipment you described, particularly the um, hydrogen related equipment, can you get a quotation, a delivery date and a maintenance manual for the equipment that was included in those projects? Yes, uh, well, we do actually. <laughs> um, so the, the electrolyzers that we've been using, for example, were made uh, by, uh, by a Danish company, uh, which sells that, so we, we can order it. Uh, I'm not sure they sell this model, uh, but they sell larger ones now. Uh, same for the fuel cells, it's actually a spin-off of our lab that produces that, so we're pretty confident on what you can get. And same for the, the storage tanks. So I'm talking about the size that we were considering. Uh, I have the feeling that there's a, a gap in, in terms of size when you're reaching perhaps several hundred kilowatts. Uh, there's less production, but I could, I could be wrong. Then there's also plenty of products that you can buy at the megawatt scale, because this is where you start having economies of scale and different applications. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, small scale, no big problem. A large scale, no big problem, but at the medium scale, uh, it can be a bit more difficult. Thank you. So one of the interesting aspects of, of trying to make a project like that successful is the operation, maintenance and repair. And in, in some of our larger rural villages, they have a lot of uh, local technical expertise, but in many of the smaller ones, they don't. Um, one of our uh, regional utilities has had a lot of success with what they call circuit rider maintenance technicians who tr fly from village to village, maintaining wind turbines. Um, and that it's very successful, but it's very expensive. And um, I was wondering if you have any comments on the best way you have found to ensure that the equipment is operated, maintained, and repaired properly? Well, obviously, the, the, the trick here is training first. Uh, it's always better if you have someone on site who can do that, uh, but it's not always possible, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, so that's why in the, in the project that the next speaker will talk about, I'm talking about that because I'm also involved in this project. So. Uh, one of the focuses is on uh, is on uh, the remote uh, operation because it's in a very remote location, and uh, from the beginning we knew that uh, having to do maintenance is going to be difficult. Um, so uh, that's why we're working on the diagnostics and the prognostics of this equipment, especially of the electrolyzer, to see okay. Is there a problem? If there is a problem, what is this problem? Can we solve it remotely or not? And then try to forecast how fast is it aging? So do we expect the end of life to be reached in uh, five years, 10 years, 20 years, I don't know. Uh, and also being able to schedule the maintenance as well as possible so that we can predict when we're going to have to send someone on site uh, to do the maintenance because we cannot send someone every two days there is too complicated it's too expensive uh, so that's something that's really considered in this project and i think it, it makes sense to try to replicate that is in the, the conditions where you were mentioning it in smaller scale projects thank you 
Um, what about safety? We, we have, of course, there's always safety concerns with fossil fuel power generation. Uh, the diesel uh, has not proven to be all that great a risk in terms of fire for the storage or the powerhouses in rural villages. However, we have a long standing problem with uh, fuel leaking into groundwater and, and causing uh, serious health problems and other problems through that mechanism. So obviously the, the fossil fuel alternative is not perfectly safe. Uh, there are injuries with the, uh, uh, on the, the maintenance of the power grids as well from the electricity itself. But com it, and compared to those types of, of safety issues that we currently have, can you say anything about the safety of the, uh, the hydrogen-based equipment? So um, I don't know yet about the exact regulation in the US, but uh, I assume it's relatively similar to what we have in Europe. Um, the regulations are very strict. So that means you, have to, you need to have the equipment tested before you, you're, you can install it. And then also you need to be trained to be able to operate it. Uh, so there's different uh, regulations that apply depending on the size of the installation. Uh, so once you have that, uh, the, the safety principles regarding hydrogen are relatively simple. Um, the risk is mainly, mainly flammability uh, the, because hydrogen is not toxic in itself. Uh, it's not going to pollute anything. At least I don't see exactly how that would be possible. Uh, so that's why there's, there's plenty of different uh, systems that are put in place with sensors to make sure that there is no leak. And if there is a leak, then take some measures to release the hydrogen and avoid any risk of explosion. Uh, we've been working with hydrogen in our lab on, on systems that are completely not commercial uh, at all and very experimental. And we haven't had any big issues so far using just simple principles. So to me, uh, safety is not really a big issue as long as you know what you're doing as, as usual. Great. Well, thank you very much, Robin. Um, that was a very interesting presentation and we'll move on now to our next presenter. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Hello, Federico. I'm glad you were able to make it, and I'm sorry about the mix-up on the, the schedule. Yeah, I'm sorry, too. Uh, it was supposed to be tomorrow, so for those who don't know, I was supposed to be in a hotel room in Prague, which I will be tomorrow. Right now, I'm in Amsterdam Airport, so you probably hear a lot of mind your staff. Fortunately, I have a noise cancelling, so I don't hear it, but you will have to suffer from that. I'm sorry about that. And no worries, and thank you for, for making it work at your end. Uh, so, uh, Federico Zenith, is a scientist in hydrogen technologies. He has a PhD in control of fuel cells from NTNU in Trondheim, postdoc in methanol fuel cells at the Max Planck Institute of Magdeburg, Germany. Since 2010, he's worked at Sintef, uh, and I won't attempt the Norwegian, but I do ex uh, suspect that the, la the word, the, the, the letter F's relates to research, Forschung, which is, I know from yeah. German. <laughs> uh, so it's a private uh, uh, for, uh, nonprofit in yeah. Norway that uh, has uh, uh, done a tremendous yeah, amount of work. From Hofer Institute. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Federico, uh, Federico has led four EU projects for a total of over 20 million euros of, uh, of funding. He's the author of 14 journal publications, holder of three patents, and awarded the 2021 Agnew Goodall Award by the Railway Division of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Federico, please. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, let's uh, share the screen. Let's see if everything works. I hope you can see it. 
Yes. Yep. I see people nodding. Yeah. Okay. So it's about producing and exporting hydrogen from stranded resources that is hydrogen that cannot be, uh, sorry, electricity that cannot be exported through the grid. And specifically, we have this project. And oh, okay. So the first the hydrogen project, something about hydrogen value is uh, number one. And then a few opportunities in feedback. I'll try to skim a bit. It's a bit long presentation, but I will give it later to you. And of course, if you have questions, please send me an email later. I will have to write for playing. So for the Alice project, uh, we are uh, sited uh, here in uh, the northernmost tip of Norway. Um, we are about the same latitude as the village formerly known as Barrow. I will not attempt that pronunciation. There is a wind park there uh, named Dragovida. It has a 200 megawatt concession. All the part has been built because there is a bottleneck in the grid and they cannot uh, manage to export that much uh, of the grid. So if you look at this peninsula, I'm gonna magnify it a bit. That's where it is. And that is the village of Bello, the last corner, the last peninsula in Norway. They have a very good capacity factor of 50%, uh, but the local consumption is uh, very limited. And the reason is local industry, well, there is very little population to begin with, have a few thousand people. And they mostly are busy with fishing, which means most of the energy requirements are diesel rather than electricity. Baranga Craft is the owner of the park and owner of the local grid, and they're part of the project. So uh, the project started in 2018. It was supposed to be end, uh, end uh, last year. Then you got an extension over two years. No prizes for guessing why. Uh, we have a budget of uh, about seven and a half million euros, uh, and uh, we installed this uh, fairly large electrolyzer in uh, Bellevue Harbor, right beside the Barents Sea. Capacity is one ton per day at uh, 30 bar, so directly pressurized production. We started production last year, finally, after a lot of delays from due to Corona, and we are virtually inside the fence, so we are not supposed to pay. Um, uh, grid tariffs in order to buy the power. The, the reason we put uh, this uh, building in front of the sea and not on the mountain where the, the actual wind farm is, is of course, accessibility. The electrolyzer was built by Cummins as uh, the rest of the system. And that tank you see there, it can hold 150 kilograms uh, of hydrogen. Other partners, well, Sintep, UBFC, of course, that's where Robin is. Uh, Technalia in Spain, or better said, Basque Country, Unisanio and Cass from Italy. So uh, once we make this uh, hydrogen, we want to have somebody to sell it. Uh, and uh, we have two sides, then the producers and the users. The producers want to sell this hydrogen, they want to have a reliable income, and mostly they want to go broke. They don't necessarily want to make a lot of money from the first day, but at least they want to go broke while waiting for the users to show up and the users. At the same time, I worried about uh, the producer to go in broke, and they want to be sure that when they buy a hydrogen car, hydrogen truck, hydrogen everything, the hydrogen will still be available, and we have a predictable, predictable cost. Excuse me. So from day one, we work together with the regional uh, authorities in Troms and Finnmark. So it helped that Warangraft is owned by municipalities, so it's sort of a government company without being a government company. And uh, here in this picture, for example, we had a workshop together with the local business leaders. It doesn't look like a lot of people, but consider that the city is about 5,000 people. So it's uh, about 1% of the population in the, in the picture. Sounds a bit better. So uh, on the supply side, we generally have energy companies, like for example, in this case, but it could also be uh, oil and gas companies. On the users, we have a, a very diverse uh, host of companies, transport, shipping, public authorities, private citizens. And uh, the uh, problem is that they are very different people. They don't really know each other. They haven't done uh, that much business with each other. So um, how do we break the chicken egg problem? First, it's not really a chicken and egg problem because the, in that case, it's a very simple. If you have to choose between users, infrastructure, you have to start with infrastructure. So that, that part of the problem is actually simple. The difficult part is making this infrastructure economically viable until there is enough demand to sustain. And uh, there are several ways, uh, like for example, finding uh, a big customer that for hydrogen that uh, keeps you in business, for example, uh, steel production or biogas or something, something that doesn't move, that's something that's not going to disappear. Or also involving the authorities, that's an important one. So guaranteeing uh, both sides, if the other side does not hold their end of the bargain, we are gonna bail you out. 
is a bit, uh, I won't go through the details, but basically it is that depending on the distance uh, and on the, amount, on the production, you can have very different uh, uh, ways of transporting uh, hydrogen. So you can look at the CSP here, it's, for example, is pipelines, uh, these compressed hydrogen in tanks, liquid hydrogen in, in trucks, sorry. And here it's desired is ships, uh, compressed or liquid hydrogen ships. That's a, a student that worked uh, for me last year. Uh, of course, these values can change a lot depending on geography and local conditions, but uh, the point is that's the general pattern. With services, we have a paper in about this, uh, and we'll not talk too much about this, but that's one of those side hustles you can have when you have an electrolyzer. You can sell this flexibility to the grid. And in some countries, not all countries, in some countries, this is a good business. For example, in Norway, it's a business. In Spain, it's pretty good business. So, what are the opportunities we found in Finnmark? Biogas plant, this was complete luck in the neighboring uh, village from uh, Bellevo, neighboring meaning 90 kilometers, that's uh, the neighboring uh, uh, sort of uh, distance you have uh, in Finnmark. <laughs> have this uh, um, biogas plant that was built and biogas can actually exploit hydrogen in order to make biomethane. So instead of uh, having a, a low value biogas, they can have high value biomethane that can be used as fuel for um, uh, for fishing boats. And uh, well, boats fuel, you can guess there's a lot of boats in that fjord, that's actually the name, that's, uh, uh, that's not a random chance, it's uh, supposed to be the fishing capital in Norway. And speaking of fishing boats, we had a, a small project to design a, a hydrogen or ammonia run fishing boat. There are already a number of battery driven boats, uh, but they're battery hybrids really. So they run on batteries when they are on the fishing field, but for propulsion is to be diesel. Using hydrogen can remove the diesel completely, and uh, uh, there is one actually one issue. If you look at the, this uh, uh, ship here, it's, it looks like it has pastro guillotine on the on the backside. And in a sense, it is. It's a bureaucratic guillotine. And the reason the quota system in Norway is based on the length of the ship. So people have been built ships this ugly and this horribly hydrodynamic. They have a lot of resistance because uh, they want to have as much uh, space as possible tied to stow fish. This creates a completely artificial pressure for um, a propulsion system that is as small as possible. And these disadvantages, uh, hydrogen and ammonia, and general renewables. That is actually a problem that is completely caused by laws and regulations, uh, not uh, by technology. So that's one thing we are, we are working on, of course. It's the politicians that have to fix this, not technologists. If you ever seen a map of Norway, there's lots of fjords. Lots of fjords means lots of ferries. And uh, uh, for passengers, not cars, so there's these pass passenger ferries that are all over the place. They are um, environmental uh, as well. Uh, for per passenger, per kilometer, they use more fuel than uh, airplanes, actually. And uh, they are pretty much everywhere along the coast. And uh, there are several um, counties in Norway that uh, will uh, place an order in a few weeks for zero emission ferries, and they can only be in hydrogen. There's no way they can run them on batteries. It's just too much energy and too much focus on uh, weight. Coastal Express, if anybody has considered uh, taking a trip to Norway, they might heard about the Hurtigruten. Uh, they are this uh, cruise ship going all the, along the coast, uh, very nice views, and uh, lots of nature. And now they want to have uh, an environmental profile. So. Um, this uh, uh, Havila company wants to have uh, uh, these cruise ships running on hydrogen at some point in the future. And their competitors, uh, is the news from uh, actually this week, they're going to do the same. Cars used to be the only thing, uh, uh, but uh, one ton a day, that's what we produce in Airbus, uh, it's enough actually for 3,000 cars. So we don't even have 1,000 people in Bellevue. So definitely, we cannot take away all that production with cars. But there is a, a strong interest still to use at least uh, some of this hydrogen for cars uh, because uh, so Finnmark is uh, of all Norway is the country with the least uh, um, sales of uh, electric cars. It's just uh, one, one in three cars is battery electric when in Norway it's about four in five, if not more. Snowmobiles, these uh, again, they don't use much hydrogen, but they are actually quite important for the local economy. There's a prototype developed in Austria, uh, and there is interest from the only place in Finnmark you probably have heard of that's uh, North Cape. They have a good number of tourists who uh, want to see the nature, and of course, giving them a zero emission trip is uh, an added value for them. 
this, I guess, Alaska can relate to planes. Uh, planes are really important to keep uh, communications uh, and uh, transport uh, running in uh, Finnmark. And uh, the, it, these kind of planes will never run on batteries. They this just. Uh, no. this is a yeah. Please contact yeah. gate B2. There's a, a very large toll port uh, uh, network in Norway. And gate uh, these planes, the dash 8, are no longer in production. And uh, uh, after 2030, they will have to be replaced because they run, will run the end of uh, uh, useful life. And they don't really know how to replace them. So hydrogen planes like the one that Alaska Air intends to develop together with Zeravia could be an alternative. Supply to Svalbard. Svalbard is a place at 80 degrees uh, latitude north. Uh, they actually have polar bears walking in the street, literally. And uh, when you hear that Norway has a 99.9% uh, uh, renewable power generation, they are the 0.1%. They still have a coal plant. They really, really want to shut down to say that Norway has 100% uh, renewable power generation. It's a bit difficult, but uh, one of the ideas is uh, to export hydrogen there and uh, to uh, then run it through micro combined heat and power systems. Ammonia production, this is the big grand plan of uh, Varanga Craft, our partner. And the idea is uh, to have a green ammonia that is produced from uh, green hydrogen. So they make green hydrogen from wind power and make ammonia, and then they sell this ammonia. There's an enormous market for ammonia. And of course, uh, it can be used also as fuel. So in conclusion, Hylos is a major step, but it's only a first step. There's a lot of bigger step to, to there is an enormous uh, potential for production uh, in Finnmark, not as big uh, for uh, consumption, but it's at least diverse. There are also demands emerging. And uh, more than a technical problem now, introducing this hydrogen economy is really a coordination problem. It's uh, no longer for technologists, it's more for, um, uh, for um, social scientists, shall we say. It's time to come on uh, the field. So thank you for your attention. Well, thank you for that uh, very interesting presentation, Federico. I um, would like to go to your very last point there to start with. You said, uh, I believe that the, uh, the challenge for hydrogen is a uh, uh, social and, and coordination problem. I'm curious about if you include economics in that, because it seems to be that's kind of the theme that we've heard throughout is either that the economics are challenging or that we don't actually have numbers. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could speak to that first. Yeah, uh, well, we have run several techno-economic uh, analysis and the result is always the same. If everybody starts ordering, uh, uh, then uh, there is no problem, but the problem who goes out first in order to start uh, building numbers. The potential is there. Uh, we don't really have uh, that uh, many expensive components inside uh, electrolyzer and fuel cells that most of uh, the cost is the engineering and the fact they, they build a, a few of them. But uh, if uh, uh, there is a coordinated push uh, and possibly an agreement also with uh, this the relatively small companies that make uh, fuel cells, uh, most are not that big. And uh, obviously, if you can give them a, a contract to, for a thousand system, then you're going to get a lot better price than if you buy only one. Okay. Well, we saw an analysis from Steve Colt earlier of um, hydrogen production, assuming free electricity free electricity, either excess nuclear or hydro or something like that. And the economics uh, were challenging in that case. But I, I think the case you're making, and we've also heard from Steve and others, is that the cost will come down significantly as the orders of magnitude of, of production of this type of equipment increases. So, in a, for example, you mentioned export of ammonia as an, uh, a major opportunity. Um, do you think that would be competitive uh, with other sources of fuel for uh, vessels, for example, or power generation without um, carbon taxes? Uh, without carbon taxes, uh, it might be difficult. Uh, someone uh, might be interested, uh, but uh, yeah, carbon taxes will, uh, will definitely uh, stimulate a lot. 
Uh, then again, yeah, I don't really have hard data on that, so I'll, I'll let the question slide. Sure, sure. Um, so it, it's very interesting to see the similarities and differences between Norway and Alaska. Um, and I don't know how familiar you are with Alaska. Have you ever been here? Nope, nowhere close, but we, I think it's always right pretty much like here. <laughs> so I, I was wondering if, if you could, um, of, the, of the many applications that you mentioned, including uh, power generation, transportation, fishing vessels, uh, uh, air transportation, which of those are most appealing in Norway? And if you can hazard a guess, which would be most appealing in Alaska? Well, uh, right now in Norway, we have definitely fishing boats uh, and uh, in general maritime are all the rage. Uh, we also have interest in, uh, in trucks, uh, in cars, so much because uh, battery uh, electric now are good enough. So you can get the more a bit more range with the hydrogen and much faster refueling, but unless you're a taxi driver, it's not really important. So for, for Alaska, I suppose that you just mentioned 200 communities uh, with the uh, mini grids. So definitely that will be a significant, uh, a significant contribution. We also discuss about hydrogen trains. I'm, I'm not even sure you have tra rail tracks in Alaska. I'm sorry, but uh, that's uh, possi possible. We do. Uh, in fact, the area I live in is called the rail belt because we have um, train tracks that run from yep. Seward to Fairbanks, several, uh, close to a thousand kilometers, I would say. Right. Uh, and uh, but for it, rail uh, in particular, rail can be one of those very good customers that are regular and provide a basis uh, for hydrogen. The cost is not the different, can they even be slightly better than battery electric? Uh, it's definitely going to be better than diesel, especially because you save a lot of maintenance. That's uh, not stressed enough. When you go electric, uh, be it battery or hydrogen, you save a lot of money on maintenance because uh, we just got used the idea that uh, uh, gas and diesel have to be expensive maintenance. Yeah, they are, but it uh, doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, that's a good point. So one of the differences between Alaska and Norway is that Norway gets almost all of its electricity from hydro. You have many fjords. And um, my agency, I, you may not have heard, but when the, the introduction was done by Curtis Thayer earlier, we actually own the largest hydro project in Alaska, and it provides 10% of the electricity for this region I mentioned, the rail belt. Well, it also has significant storage behind the dam. And it's actually more than 200 gigawatt hours of storage, which is a lot by our standards. Our average loads on the rail belt are about 500 megawatts. So 200 gigawatt hours is a lot of, of energy storage. And I'm wondering if that is uh, a factor for consideration in Norway, if you're looking as, at hydrogen as an energy storage mechanism for power generation, whether just storing the energy in the, your existing dams is uh, a more attractive option when that's available. Absolutely. Um, hydropower is a lot better than hydrogen. I'm, I'm not afraid of saying it. It's just that the efficiency is just enormous. Uh, you can have problems uh, in terms of capital costs. You have to build the dams and it depends completely on geographical factors. We had cases in Norway where um, indigenous people uh, raised a little bit of hell when uh, they, their valleys were filled with water. And uh, like can be uh, a dam in Finnmark, actually, uh, the Alta dam that one in the early 80s was uh, uh, our Keystone XL kind of moment. Um, and of course, but if you do have a, a hydropower, definitely you have to use it as, as much as it's worth because it's definitely going to be better than anything once you have. Um, Hydrogen, in the case of if you, you have also a problem with efficiency, if you make hydrogen for electricity and then back electricity, you're going to get, if, if everything goes up per perfect, about 40% round trip efficiency. And uh, that is a difficult economic case. Uh, but if you're still, you're in any case making hydrogen because you're selling for trains, uh, ships, uh, cars, whatever, you can modulate the production from the electrolyzers to provide grid services. And that is a better economic case that can generate uh, some income. 
Well, thank you. That's that's a very um, uh, clear answer. Um, you mentioned on uh, slide twenty three uh, that one of the things you're considering is the gradual introduction of hydrogen into the energy system. And I'm wondering if that includes blending hydrogen with hydrocarbon fuels. If so, which fuels and what types of applications? Well, not really, uh, but it's not so. We uh, heard some people considering using some hydrogen together with diesel, but we have not really pursued that. So I'm quite ignorant of the topic. And not with LNG or natural gas? Yeah. Now, we, we tend to, to go straight for a zero emission, so just low emission is not enough, considering the, the latest uh, estimate is we have two and a half years to save the plant. So, yeah, we don't really have time for half-baked solutions. Well, thank you for making that point. Um, so, it, as far as the, the, the difference between storing hydrogen as a liquid or, or in, in, as a pressurized gas, can you men talk about the pros and cons of those two options? Yeah, well, obviously, compress is a lot easier. And if, in the case of Helus, uh, liquid does not make any sense because you don't have volume. If you start at several thousand tons a day, it might make sense. Uh, but I mean, in the whole of Europe, we have four hydrogen liquefaction plants. Four. Uh, and of course, uh, they actually built um, a liquid hydrogen fuel, the ferry in Norway. And then the closest plant is in Germany. And there is a, obviously a truck that we need to travel all the way from Germany up to Norway, emitting a lot more CO2 than what have been emitted if the diesel had been used on the ferry. So that, that doesn't make any sense. And that ferry alone does not have a sufficient consumption to justify establishing liquid hydrogen production in Norway to begin with. So that was a kind of a, um, there was not much brain power at use in that decision. Uh, Liquid hydrogen is a, a great technology, but it's something that completely depends on large scale. So as until we get there, we we'll really need to stick to compressed, which is a lot, actually, it's a, a lot cheaper than people think. Some people think that it's so expensive to compress hydrogen. It's not. You need the one, two kilowatt hours out of a total of uh, 50, 55 that you need to produce it. Okay. Well, great. Thank you. Um, well, We've, we're at the end of our time, so uh, I want to thank you again, Federico. That was very interesting, and especially for making it work during your travels. Very much appreciated. Thank you very much, and sorry for all the noise you must have heard. No, it, it actually worked pretty well. Great. So um, now I got to catch my plane, but if somebody has uh, um, some questions, they, uh, I think if somebody put out my, uh, my email address, please do send me an email, and we'll be able to answer later. Okay, great. Good, good. Have a good trip. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. So, our next presenter is um, uh, an Alaskan. He's David LePayne from the uh, Division of Geological and Ge Geophysical Surveys at the Department of Natural Resources. Dr. LePayne has 34 years of experience working on the geology and petroleum systems of Alaska's sedimentary basins with a focus on the petroleum reservoir potential of fluvial deltaic and deep water depositional systems on the North Slope and in Cook Inlet. He earned a PhD from the University of Alaska in Fairbanks where he completed a dissertation project on carboniferous sedimentary rocks exposed in the range front region of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. You know that's the, those are that's quite a mouthful. I think I might have done better with the Norwegian, <laughs> but anyway, uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Lapain, and, uh, and please take it away. I'd like to thank uh, ASEP for inviting me to speak today, and thank them for organizing this uh, workshop. I believe in uh, full disclosure. I'm a I'm a petroleum geologist, but I'm not an expert on uh, carbon capture and sequestration. I've spent most of my working career uh, working the geology of northern Alaska and southern Alaska, namely Cook Inlet. And I've worked in several sedimentary basins between the two in the interior. So I know the geology fairly well. I know the petroleum geology fairly well, but I am not a sequestration expert. So um, 
anyhow, I just wanted to uh, disclose that. So what I'm going to do today is just provide a brief overview of three options for geological storage of uh, CO2 in Alaska's sedimentary basins. The focus is going to be largely on the North Slope and Cook Inlet with significant emphasis on the latter in uh, Cook Inlet. So this is going to be a high level view uh, with a lot of details omitted. So what I'd like to do is first uh, summarize Alaska's gas resources. They're vast. Um, we'll look at a slide there and I'll summarize the volumes. Um, and then I'd like to go through three uh, sequestration options. They're kind of low hanging fruit. Um, so CO2 injection and depleted or declining oil fields. So fields that are producing, but their production is declining. Uh, CO2 injection in unminable subsurface coal seams, CO2 injection in saline aquifers, uh, mineral carbonation is that last uh, dash down there. I'm not going to address that. We have rocks scattered in some areas of the state that may be amenable to mineral carbonation, but it is largely unknown as to the potential for that method in this state. So I'm not going to spend any time uh, talking about it. I will just say here, and I think it's also covered in my summary slide, there's a pilot project uh, in Iceland underway right now, where they're um, trying to convert CO2 into minerals that are then locked into basalt formations. So um, it seems to be promising, um, and we uh, will probably hear a lot more about it in the future. I'll end the talk with uh, some conclusions and a path forward. So let's start with Alaska's gas resources. Most of the resources are located on the North Slope and they're stranded. That means there's no, there's no way to move them uh, to market right now. So they're stranded up on the North Slope. So proven reserves, these are reserves that we know are present uh, roughly about 35 to 36 trillion cubic feet of gas. Undiscovered reserves as estimated by the US Geological Survey, they're undiscovered but technically recoverable based on current technology. There's no economic filter there, so they may be very expensive, some of those uh, uh, resources. But the undiscovered but technically recoverable gas resources on the slope are huge, roughly 172,000 trillion cubic feet of gas. And those resources are distributed between what we refer to as conventional reservoirs and unconventional reservoirs, the cost to produce unconventional resources is considerably higher. Like I say, they're, they're stranded resources. Cook Inlet, much less proven reserves are about 815 billion cubic feet of gas. Uh, undiscovered but technically recoverable gas is about 19,000 trillion cubic feet of gas. And those two are also distributed between conventional and unconventional um, resources. So to use Alaska's natural gas resources as feedstock for hydrogen production requires exploration investment. You got to you gotta find all that undiscovered gas and you have to move that undiscovered gas to where it can be utilized. So that's going to require investment up front, but you also have to have a plan if you're going to use that as feedstock for uh, hydrogen generation, you have to have a plan to deal with the leftover carbon. So geological sequestration options, um, these essentially all boil down to taking CO2 and injecting it into the subsurface of uh, Alaska's sedimentary basins and removing it from the atmosphere for hopefully many, many thousands of years. This graphic on the right side of this slide is just a simplified view of Alaska's sedimentary basins. Most of these basins, they're kind of shown in that, uh, oh, ugly kind of yellowy green color. So hopefully you can see my cursor here. This is the North Slope sedimentary basin. Uh, this is the Nanana sedimentary basin, Yukon Flat sedimentary basin, Cook Inlet down here, just to name a few of them. So the stars, the red stars mark the North Slope. That's near where many producing fields are located immediately uh, to, the, to the west, but also to the east of the uh, 
uh, Dalton Highway there shown and taps shown in green. And then the star down uh, near Anchorage is Cook Inlet Sedimentary Basin as well. So the storage options include injecting CO2 in depleted oil fields or oil fields that are in decline. And so then you can use the CO2 for enhanced oil production, injecting CO2 in unminable coal seams in the subsurface. And the third one is injecting CO2 in saline aquifers. All these options, all these options require new infrastructure and significant capital investment. The reason I star the North Slope and Cook Inlet is because we have many producing oil fields in both basins. We have many producing gas fields in Cook Inlet Basin. So these basins have proven oil and gas fields and they have proven reservoirs, proven traps and proven seals. So we know beyond a doubt that they have significant storage capacity for liquids and gases, whether they're hydrocarbon gases, hydrocarbon liquids or CO2. So this is, I'm trying to drill down now and starting to focus exclusively on Cook Inlet and the North Slope. So these are the two basins that I said that have proven storage potential, and they would potentially work for all three of the geological sequestration options that I mentioned in the previous slide, proven reservoirs, proven traps, and proven seals. In both basins, North Slope and Cook Inlet, we have abundant coal resources in the subsurface in addition to um, known and producing oil and gas fields. So the diagram on the left there, Cook Inlet stratigraphy, it's showing the younger stratigraphy in Cook Inlet Basin. The green dots show where uh, oil production is coming from. So the West Foreland, Hemlock, Tionic formations, that's where most of the oil reservoirs that are producing today in Cook Inlet Basin. The red dots are where most of the gas is being produced in Cook Inlet Basin. The, um, the black uh, horizontal lines, those are just denoting where coal bearing stratigraphy is known to occur. So in Cook Inlet Basin, most of the subsurface coal seams are in the Tionic Formation, Beluga Formation, and Sterling Formation. Shifting to the diagram on the right, that's showing simplified view of the North Slope stratigraphy. And you can see uh, in the vicinity of the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska, you can see a list of the known oil and gas fields. Again, uh, green is oil, red is gas. And then over here, kind of in the center of this column, uh, you see some of the bigger oil fields that are located right near the terminus of the Dalton Highway and the start of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. So the big one is Kaparik, and the really big one is Prudhoe Bay, and another big one is Endicott Field. So all of these fields are presently in decline, and we know that many of these fields were huge when they were uh, discovered, and we'll touch on the original oil in place volumes in the, next, uh, in the next slide. So anyway, just to point out or state what I've already said, both of these basins, we have uh, known oil and gas fields with proven reservoirs, proven traps, and proven seals. And we have abundant coal in the subsurface of Cook Inlet. We also have abundant coal in the subsurface of the North Slope. So just to back up uh, uh, and, and, and take a minute just to review geological requirements for effective long-term CO2 sequestration in a sedimentary basin. So you have to have the following. Um, you have to have a reservoir. Typically on the North Slope and in Cook Inlet, most of the reservoirs are sandstones. Those sandstones have porosity, that's void space in the rock. That void space can be occupied by water, by gas, by oil, or it can be occupied by CO2. We have to have permeability. Permeability is essentially connections between those pores, and the permeability allows fluid to move through the rock. You have to have permeability. You also have to have effective traps and low permeability top seals. And that's what I'm showing here in this uh, cartoon right here. You have a fold structure. This here is an anticline. Think of it as an inverted bowl, another anticline, another inverted bowl, and another anticline, another inverted bowl. So yellow is sand, porous and permeable. Gray is a low permeability top seal. So the combination of a fold like this, 
a fold like this, a fold like this, and the overlying low permeability rock, most likely a shale, forms an effective trap. So you can take uh, hydrocarbon gas, you can take oil, or you can take CO2. You can uh, put it into this porous and permeable formation. It will migrate up to the crest of the structure and accumulate here and effectively be trapped. This slide over here is just a photomicrograph of a thin section uh, taken using a microscope. And these are mineral grains. This is quartz. Uh, these are mud, mudstones. And the blue is porosity. And so this is what you want in the rock. This is void space, and you can put a liquid or a gas in here. This is a, a diagram up here in the upper right. For coal, you also need a permeability network. You need to be able to move a liquid or a gas into the coal. So we call fractures in coal. That's, that's uh, the permeability. Those are permeability pathways. They're referred to as cleats, coal cleats. And these typically are naturally occurring in coal seams. So this is what you have to have to be able to store oil, store gas, or store CO2 uh, in, a, in a subsurface formation. Any kind of CO2 injection going forward down the road, you're going to have to monitor that the trap, the reservoir that you're injecting the CO2 into, you have to monitor that it's actually trapping the CO2 and keeping it in place. Um, like I say, these fields are known, they're proven. And so that should not be an issue, but it's just um, doing the due diligence as you're executing a project and you're moving the CO2 into the subsurface. You want to make sure it's staying put. So um, this is looking at the CO2 sequestration potential in depleted or declining oil fields. So this graphic up here is just a Landsat image showing the North Slope. Uh, roughly between the uh, eastern part of the MPRA and the western part of the 1002 area in Anwar. And all the producing fields up on the slope are essentially located in this swath of real estate. And then down here, this is a, a false color image of Cook Inlet. You can see most of the known oil and gas fields are shown by these red and green blobs. Green is oil red is gas. And the thing I want to point out here is these are large fields on the slope. So this is Prudhoe Bay. When they initially discovered it in the late 60s, they estimated the oil in place to be 25 billion barrels of oil. To date, they've produced greater than 12.5 billion barrels of oil. So there's a lot of storage capacity at Prudhoe Bay. Kaparik, a similar deal, uh, when it was discovered, they estimated 6 billion barrels of oil in place, and to date, they've produced about 2.5 billion barrels. And you can go on down the list. The thing to point out, though, is the really big fields are up on the North Slope. The smaller fields are in Cook Inlet. But there's still, there's still significant uh, uh, oil resources in these fields in Cook Inlet, even though they're a lot, they're a lot smaller than the North Slope. They're still significant, and many many of these have been producing since the early 1960s. And you can see the the original oil in place volumes shown here, uh, right after the uh, uh, left parenthesis, and then the produced volumes shown after the uh, uh, semicolon there. So. What makes Cook Inlet so interesting and the North Slope, most of these fields are in decline. And CO2 is used in many places around the world, including in the lower 48, um, in enhanced oil uh, recovery. So when you inject CO2, usually in the supercritical state into a reservoir, um, it helps move oil. It helps move oil to producing wells. And so you can boost production. A DOE funded study um, provided screening level economics. Now these numbers are about 15 years old. So I apologize for that. They're dated. But as of the mid 2000s, um, for MacArthur River Field in Cook Inlet Basin, they figured if you had oil uh, selling for greater than $35 to $40 a barrel, it would be economically viable to inject CO2 into the MacArthur River reservoirs to help produce oil. Um, so that just kind of gives you an idea of the economics, 
albeit dated, on how CO2 injection can be used to boost oil production. But it also, in the same process, helps you uh, sequester the CO2. And like I say, it's being done many places around the world. As of the mid-2000s, there were more than 70 CO2 EOR, that's enhanced oil recovery programs worldwide. So it's a proven technique. So I don't have volumes to share with you as far as how much CO2 could potentially be sequestered in these reservoirs. But if you look at the original oil in place volumes, I think you can use that as at least a first order screening metric for the storage capacity of these, of these oil fields. So let's just zero in on Granite Point. That's just one field in Cook Inlet. It's encompassed uh, or enclosed by this red um, rectangle. The field is shown in green because it's producing oil. So again, we have a proven reservoir, proven trap, proven seal. Original oil in place was estimated at about 730 million barrels. Uh, it's produced to date about 150 million barrels. A DOE funded study estimated that you could recover an additional 35 million barrels of oil by injecting CO2 in the supercritical state into the Granite Point reservoirs. And they estimated about eight MCF of CO2 per incremental barrel of oil produced. So the challenge here, if you're going to use CO2, you want to sequester it, and you also want to use it to boost oil production, you need to make sure that you move the oil, but you keep the CO2 in the reservoir. So that's an engineering problem. So the capacity of Granite Point is, is to hold CO2 is finite, but it's significant. And this is only one field uh, in Cook Inlet. There are at least four other sizable oil fields in the inlet that could be used for uh, uh, enhanced oil or that, that that could use CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. So, you know, you've got similar situations up on the North Slope. The reason I focus on Cook Inlet is because most of these fields are, are in decline. You've got infrastructure in the inlet, namely the Marathon Oil Refinery there located near Nikiski. Marathon is uh, considering selling that refinery because they are concerned about a reliable supply of crude to run the refinery. And so what this could also do, if you're using CO2 for enhanced oil uh, recovery, you could boost oil production while sequestering CO2 and also extending the, light, the life of uh, Marathon's refinery at, uh, at, at Nikiski. The other thing to point out, I'd be remiss if I didn't say any kind of sequestration uh, options going for going forth in Cook Inlet, there's high seismic risk. This is located about 150 to 200 kilometers north of the Aleutian megathrust, uh, a short distance to the east in Prince William Sound, 1964. We had the second highest earthquake in recorded history on the planet, uh, magnitude 9.2 Good Friday earthquake. So any kind of uh, CO2 sequestration plans moving forward in the Cook Inlet region has to account for high seismic risk. So CO2 sequestration in unminable coal seams. You know, Cook Inlet has thousands of feet of coal bearing strata in the subsurface. The North Slope also has significant coal resources as well. In fact, most of the state's coal resources are located on the slope, but Cook Inlet is very significant. It's not a widely appreciated fact outside of geological circles, but even in geological circles that over 50% of the nation's coal are located in Alaska. And there's sizable coal resources in Cook Inlet. Many seams in Cook Inlet are up to 60 feet thick. That's 18 meters. That's huge. And um, most seams in the subsurface are expected to have methane either in the free form or adsorbed to the coal matrix. And whether it's adsorbed on the coal matrix or free in the cleat system will depend on the depth and the hydrostatic pressure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Coal rank and ash content affect the CO2 storage capacity. Higher rank coals, bituminous and anthracite, they have lower storage capacity. Lower rank coals like subbituminous coals and lignites, 
they have higher storage capacity. Again, the reason Cook Inlet is so attractive is we have a lot of infra infrastructure there. We have the LNG plant, we have the agrium, the uh, shuttered agrium uh, 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 ammonia plant. Um, Schellenbaum and Clough in 2010 in a DOE funded study estimated the CO2 storage capacity in subsurface coal seams in Cook Inlet at 43 gigatons. Think about that, that's a huge number. On the North Slope, even though North Slope has more coal, they estimated the storage capacity at only 5.83 gigatons. Part of the explanation for that discrepancy is uh, North Slope coals tend to be higher rank, but you also have permafrost on the North Slope. And so that greatly complicates uh, uh, sequestration plans and it reduces the uh, sequestration potential. There's an interesting hey, thing. Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Um, yes, I can. We, we're scheduled to end at 11. So I was wondering if you could wrap it up in a couple minutes. Yes, I can. I can. Thank you for that. Uh, the other thing to do here, um, I'll just mention it in these two slides. I won't go over them. You can use uh, CO2 at, uh, to enhance gas um, uh, recovery. Like I say, most coal seams in the subsurface have methane adsorbed to the coal. If you inject the gas, uh, or CO2, CO2 sorbs more tightly onto coal, it displaces methane. So you would move the methane towards a producing well and also store the CO2 in the coal seam. So the last one I wanna talk about is sequestration in saline aquifers. This is really uh, poorly known. And so no estimates of uh, sequestration uh, capacity are available, but some people believe that you can sequester more CO2 in saline aquifers in the subsurface than in coal seams or in depleted oil and gas fields. Um, fresher water is better. Uh, saline, uh, uh, high, highly saline water is not as good and like I say, the estimates are very poorly constrained and there are no estimates available for, for Cook Inlet. More data are needed, but like I say, some people think this is the best option. So I'll just wrap it up. Alaska has huge gas reserves. Most of them are on the slope and they're stranded. Um, many sedimentary basins in the state, but the most prospective basins from a CO2 sequestration potential are on the North Slope and in Cook Inlet. Um, we have proven CO2 injection potential just demonstrated by the fact that we have many producing oil and gas fields with proven traps, reservoirs, and seals. So more work is needed to characterize the injection potential for all options, and uh, the economics need to be addressed uh, as well. The gas resources are concentrated on the slope, so we need to move those resources uh, to get them to where they can be used to generate hydrogen and where the leftover CO2 can be stored in a basin like Cook Inlet. That's all I have. Thank you very much, David. Uh, that was very interesting. And in fact, um, I'm fascinated by some of the points you made regarding the potential economic drivers of uh, carbon sequestration. Um, we've, I'm just gonna take a few minutes uh, to uh, finish the discussion before we move on. Uh, one of the questions we got in the chat and that I was wondering myself is um, what level of confidence would we have or should we have in the uh, uh, security of storing CO2 in the ways you mentioned? And I, the reason I'm asking the question is that uh, the benefit, it goes away if it leaks even over a long period of time. Absolutely. No, you're, 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 you're exactly right. Um, Cook Inlet, as I mentioned, has uh, enormous storage potential, but Cook Inlet is a seismically active uh, basin. And so there is a very significant seismic risk. And so if you have a major uh, seismic event, it is possible that you could breach a reservoir and you could get CO2 leaking to the surface. Um, the risk is much less up on the North Slope, um, but the, up on the North Slope, those uh, uh, injection targets, those sequestration targets might be considerably, uh, might be located a considerable distance away from where you want to actually generate the hydrogen. And so where you generate the hydrogen, that's where you're gonna have the leftover carbon. And so, you know, you may, if you generate the hydrogen up on the North Slope, 
then you have uh, sequestration options up there that have much lower seismic risk. So it's it's seismic risk in Cook Inlet is 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 the greatest risk factor as far as breaching a reservoir and having hydrogen leak to the surface. I think we know enough. If you remove the seismic risk, we know enough about those reservoirs to to understand their ability to hold CO2. If you remove the seismic risk, I think um, those reservoirs are able to store the CO2 for geologically significant periods of time. It's the seismic risk in Cook Inlet that is the wild card. Would there be a a way to mitigate that risk by having uh, many separate uh, storage uh, locations? There might be, yes. So you store uh, a smaller volume in a given field and distribute the volume among other fields. And so you reduce the capillary pressure that is exerted on the seal rock that is overlying the reservoir. And so that that could be a, a, a mitigation strategy. But take what I just said with a grain of salt, because I am not a CO2 sequestration expert. But it just seems logical that you could reduce or mitigate the risk. So one last question, what what level of interest do you see from the majors in these economic aspects of uh, carbon sequestration that you described that that I find so interesting? Um, The economics are going to be critical. Um, The the, the, the existing production infrastructure uh, in Cook Inlet and on the North Slope designed to move uh, gas and oil, largely oil on the slope, but they do produce gas on the slope and they re-inject it in uh, Prudhoe Bay and, and, and various other fields to help maintain uh, formation pressure. They also use some of the gas to run oil field operations up there. Um, but, but the point is all that infrastructure is designed to move oil and or gas, not CO2. CO2 is highly corrosive. And so you're probably looking at uh, either building new lines to move the CO2 or doing some very serious retrofitting of existing lines to be able to move CO2 uh, uh, in in those pipelines. I would imagine that uh, oil companies producing oil on the slope and in Cook Inlet would be interested in a reliable, affordable source of CO2 for enhanced oil recovery operations. I didn't point this out, but nowhere in the state has CO2 been used in uh, enhanced oil recovery operations? And I think, um, like I said, if, if, if a reliable, affordable source of CO2 were available, I would be surprised if some of the oil companies operating in the state were not interested in using that uh, CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. But the Absolutely. economics, you know, you've got to, you've got to, uh, you've got to have an infrastructure that can handle a corrosive uh, substance. A very interesting point, and seems like uh, the our entire uh, workshop has uh, kept coming back to economics. So yeah. that's a good point to end on. Thank you very much for your presentation, and I'll turn it back over to Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, uh, David. <laughs> the team, David. Um, this was great. Uh, everything from microgrids to uh, exporting hydrogen from Norway to carbon sequestration prospects, um, fascinating. And I will ask you, um, Dave, to maybe take a look at those chat comments and and answer some of those questions. It's hard to keep up with all of them. We are now moving to our break. You'll see the timer that will be the countdown. Uh, During the break, we'll be showcasing some of the upcoming events, including other workshops, Arctic X, the Alaska Sustainable Energy Conference. And when we come back, we'll be diving into hydrogen for buildings and heat, as well as some green hydrogen options to wrap up today's session. So thank you so much. We'll see you in a short period of time. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you were able to uh, take a quick break. We are going to switch gears now into talking about hydrogen for buildings and heat as we continue our session two. And it is my absolute privilege to welcome our next discussant, uh, Mr. Bruno Gruno uh, from MREL's Clove Climate Housing Research Center, CCHRC in Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, Prior to joining NREL in 2020, CCHRC had a a 20 year history as an independent nonprofit partnering with people all over Alaska to develop sustainable, affordable and durable housing 
And uh, Bruno is really the perfect uh, moderator and host for our next speaker, um, Ms. Janet Weiser, whom he will introduce. So Bruno, please take it away and thank you so much. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, Erin. Great to see you. Um, yeah, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, and it's a real pleasure and honor to introduce Janet this morning. I will have to say that getting to know her in preparation for this has been a real highlight for me. Uh, and Ms. Reiser has been, currently serves as the president of Hydrogen Technology. Uh, she's, she's an experienced policymaker, senior executive, and program manager for over 35 years of experience in energy management, engineering, construction, and telecommunications, most recently running uh, Alaska Energy Authority. She's experienced in all phases of enterprise development operations, as well as in executive and technical management. And uh, Janet's a, a chemical engineer by education. So Janet, glad to have you here. It's just a pleasure to, to share this, this session with you. Thank you, uh, Bruno. Oh, I guess I'm on. Thank you, Bruno. Um, it has been fun talking to you over the last couple of days. And I have to tell you, it's so exciting to see a lot of the names of people that I miss and uh, people that I recognize. Thank you so much for inviting to me uh, inviting me to be part of it. I've already learned a lot. I really, really am going to have to replay all of this so I can make sure I can capture all the information. Um, so I'm going to take you down a little bit of a different road here and let me start by sharing my screen. Again, thank you all for being here. I think this is a great forum. I really appreciate it, Erin. Particularly, thank you for inviting me and thinking of me. A lot of great presenters and a lot of good information is out there. So I just want to, like uh, Bruno said, my next incarnation of life is as president of Hydrogen Technologies. Um, as I was preparing to leave Alaska, I got a call from some mutual friends. And they said, hey, this guy's got a really good idea, but he doesn't know what to do with it. And I say, yeah, 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 what is that? And he said, well, he's got this hydrogen boiler and it burns only hydrogen and oxygen and has no greenhouse gas emissions. And I thought, hmm, really? So I took a look at it and it looked really interesting to me. So I started working with him to try to get it to a point where we could get some investors. And while we were doing that, we had three investors come to us. And um, so now we, are, we were then purchased by uh, Jericho Energy. Um, and they are, they are, uh, we're a wholly owned subsidiary of them now. And, you know, they've provided, they're doing all the stuff I don't like to do, like market and all that kind of stuff. So I, I get to stay on the technology side and I enjoy that. So my talk today is on building in district heat. Um, I'm going to, I'm not an expert on any of these things, but what I do know a lot about is what we have done internally for our company. It's not a sales pitch. This is kind of trying to take the great ideas about hydrogen, the great potential of hydrogen, and bring it down to an application that actually um, gets that reduction that you're looking for, removes something from the space that is polluting and replaces it with something that doesn't pollute. So in that sense, this is an engineer's dream to put something into reality. So basically what we have is a hydrogen boiler. And uh, in the context of district heat or building heat, there are lots of ways to heat, obviously. Um, but boilers are probably the most common way to heat worldwide. Boilers, you know, they're ubiquitous. And I didn't even realize that 37% of carbon emissions come from boilers uh, um, worldwide, whether they be used in, just in industrial settings or they be used in um, district heat or wherever they may be used. But a lot of them are old and, um, you know, they just in the back of the room, you used to be able to hit them with a wrench and then make them work again. But I don't think you could do that anymore. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. But the, this is what um, Bruno said. Well, you better tell people what a boiler is. I'm like, oh, OK. Uh, there are many, many types of boilers, as many of you know. Um, basically, it's two components. Um, there's usually a firebox or a combustion chamber and then a heat transfer chamber. And so this is a standard tube fired uh, steam boiler. Boilers just make steam or hot water. That's what they do. That steam is used in a variety of ways. It can be used in CHP. It can be used to run a steam turbine. It can be used to make baby food, cosmetics, uh, distill whiskey. It, it goes on and on and on. And, you know, why, why are people getting interested? We talked a lot about we need to get this down to the level that people will buy it and use it and get companies to embrace it so that we can get good products out the door. So from our standpoint, as a commercial company, it's a huge opportunity out there. Commercial industrial heating 
just that, not even industrial processing, is a $28 billion a year business. And about half of that is commercial heating and the other half of it is industrial, just heating. Um, again, lots of other uses for steam. Uh, People are, it's a confluence as you, as many other speakers have mentioned. I think Julia also mentioned incentives, but there's an interesting confluence right now of regulation, board mandate, costs coming down with scale, a lot of those really exciting things that are coming together and people are putting in a lot of money. The investment community, and I spend a lot of time with them because, you know, we're all about investors. Um, the investment community is giving you scores on your you're doing green scores for your investments and where the, where the money is going, it's going to hydrogen, primarily on the energy space. So these are some of the colleges that we're working with and their commitments. They've made either dollar commitments or percent reduction commitments, but um, many boards of regents, many boards of directors are very focused on setting goals that their companies need to meet. This one I had to have because I think this is so cool. This is a Jap. This is the first liquefied hydrogen carrier. And I thought about Alaska because I love Alaska. I, I actually sneak back there every once in a while. And this is this was launched in 2019, and its sole purpose is to take uh, liquefied hydrogen from Australia to Japan. Well, Alaska is closer than Australia. That's all I got to say. All right. Um, looking at what is Alaska already doing on district heat, there are several opportunities out there, and there are probably many, many more um, how you do district heat. So I just put that map in there because I liked it. So one of the things I want to talk about there, when you look at vessels, and our company makes both, what are, what are we using for vessels? Well, we're using, we can make them with uh, pressure or non-pressure, and you can use it again. That's just probably just... Um, a reiteration of all the possible heating applications. We also get a lot of people wanting to use it for sterilization and, you know, heat sterilizing air, which is kind of odd to me, but anyway. Okay, next one. So what, it, what have we got? So if you take a look at carbon emissions in boilers, um, ours is a zero emission, and I'll tell you how we're doing that now. But if you look at the carbon emissions, pounds for MMBTUs that is made, you can see that, you know, zero emission hydrogen, then you've got your natural gas, coal, biomass, they're all, they're all in there. We have figured out a way to make a zero emission boiler that is, uses only hydrogen and only oxygen and produces energy and water. So this is the, the boiler from earlier and what we have done. So typically when you look on the bottom right, you've got your firebox and you typically have fuel and air. And with air, you get, um, you get night, you know, you get your N's, your S's, you get a variety of things that, that make greenhouse gas emissions, right? We do, we only put in hydrogen and oxygen relatively pure as like you would get from an electrolyzer. And I want to make a comment about electrolyzers. There's, Again, very exciting things happening in the electrolyzer space. We're actually buying an electrolyzer company that is a direct solar electrolyzer. But there's so many interesting things happening with, you know, down on the ground people in industry to make this happen. One of the things that's um, really exciting to me with electrolyzers um, is that we have, are working with Plug Power and a couple other electrolyzer manufacturers to capture their oxygen as well as their hydrogen. So typically an electrolyzer would just vent the oxygen. We have a deal now with plug power um, that we will actually take, because it comes out in stoichiometric ratio, is, which is what our feed is. So we'll take that oxygen and we'll take that hydrogen and recombine them. So if you think of it in a simple chemical equation, energy in to split the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen, and then we put it back together and get the energy out. It's basically that simple. Uh, some nuances to it. Um, it's, it's a little bit tricky. So what I want to point out is what we've done, we don't introduce any combustion air. Hydrogen and oxygen are, are brought into the unit separately. So there, there's no, we don't pre-mix. We don't do any of that because that's not safe. Uh, a small spark is made and there's a lot of energy released. And that uh, superheated steam is temperated and put through the tube side of the heat exchanger. On the shell side, you have your working fluid. 
And one of the things that's really important is then we don't have to vent anything. We don't have any carbon to vent. We don't have any NOx or SOx to vent. And it does two things. It keeps you from cre- you can't you can't you can't vent greenhouse gases if you don't make them. And the second thing is usually that vent is a hot gas path and you lose a lot of your efficiency as well. So we keep the efficiency in the form of energy and we also um, do not make greenhouse gas to vent that. So that's why I put my, took me a long time to find these little crossover things, but that's what's different in, in our system. And, and I'm not really trying to promote our system. I'm just saying that there are a lot of people out at the commercial level, the last mile if to use a telecom thing um, that is that are really pushing the envelope. So what you hear when people say they have a hydrogen boiler, typically what you have, and I'll, let me see if my little pointer, typically they're sparging into their natural gas boiler about 20% hydrogen to make it burn hotter, uh, maybe get better heat transfer and improve efficiency. But as you can see on this, from this curve, that is reducing your CO2 by less than 10%. You're still going to have to um, get rid of the CO2. You're still going to have to have, um, you still have your atmospheric air coming in. So you still have emissions to deal with. Ours is on the, well, my, my face is in the way. Hang on. Ours is over here. We make it 100%. And um, so we get rid of all of the carbon in there. So basically, what are we doing? Um, we have several... It's come, and as I think, again, Julia mentioned this, incentives all over the world um, are available for people. So we have huge companies, small companies, big companies, engineering firms coming to us. Um, We have, and what we do now is we're doing some feasibility studies on uh, base load steam generation, peak generation, looking at, and I think there were a couple of really good presentations on this that I took note of on bringing in hydrogen or producing it directly. So remember, if we use an electrolyzer uh, to make our hydrogen and oxygen, it makes it exactly the ratio we need and in the purity that we need it. And then we condense that or we uh, react that and the hydrogen and oxygen goes back to water and that goes back to the electrolyzer. So from a standpoint of needing makeup water, we have a little makeup water that we use, but that purified water that we use, ours is fuel, um, as a product from the electrolyzer, stays in the system. You're not spending money, um, you know, getting more water, pumping it in, and you're not spending uh, resources. And water resources are becoming, particularly in some parts of California, very scarce. So, um, so that's a closed loop. So that's that's we think that's pretty darn exciting. Um, let's see. So basically, we can use you know, if you bring your hydrogen and oxygen in. You know, we do a lot of feasibility studies for folks right now. We're doing about 15 feasibility studies for large corporations that I can't talk about. But anyway, we're in the middle of that. Um, We look at financial. We take a look at whatever the regulatory system that they're operating under is, where they get their hydrogen, what's that cost, what are their incentives, what is their tax, what does their tax profile look at? And then um, on the technical side, We have developed two patents with two patent pendings, and those patents are around our burner technology. And then uh, patent pendings on, um, so our system operates as a slight vacuum. I think there was a comment earlier about hydrogen embrittlement. We had a complete study done on hydrogen embrittlement. The fact that we operate under a slight vacuum um, reduced, it eliminates that. that threat inside of our equipment. We've developed two models so far. Uh, We're developing another model that will be five times larger than our 6,000 kilograms of steam an hour. It takes about 0.02 kilograms of hydrogen to make a kilogram of steam. So right now we have um, designed a facility to test, a testing facility. Oops, what happened? We have, uh, we also have Um, We're making our first commercial boiler for a distillery in Scotland, and we have several other pilot projects underway. underway. But for us, this is very exciting because we can significantly reduce the amount of carbon. The other thing is, if you think, okay, what about like compared to fuel cells? Well, they make electricity, we make steam, which could make electricity. But we don't use 
actually our boiler is simpler than most other boilers because we don't have any induced draft fans or forced draft fans. You know, we have to do um, maintenance like anybody else, depending on the quality of your working fluid. But generally speaking, um, it's very straightforward and low maintenance. So we, we're pretty excited about it. We think it can benefit a lot of people and a lot, a lot of people in the world and help help the problem. So that's kind of the end of what I had to say uh, formally, but I'm excited about all of this. I'm excited about you guys and try to incorporate your thoughts into what we're doing. So Bruno, take it away. Yeah. Thank you. Gosh, Janet. So I'll just, I'll just uh, ask uh, the audience if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat or question and answer uh, column here. You know, it's funny when I'm learning about new technologies, I like to ask myself how I describe this to my kids or my mom. Uh, you know, how does hydrogen impact us on everyday life? And I'll tell you this morning, this whole idea here, Janet, zero emissions, like this is something I, I did talk to my kids to about over toast and eggs this morning. Because I hear a lot of, of discussion about hydrogen production, hydrogen storage, hydrogen power cars are already on the street. But I'm a buildings guy, right? And we all live in one. Um, but I'm just seeing this application tickles me to death. Uh, and, and it's just so relatable, especially to anyone in, in cold climates. Um, you know, I'm thinking about as we decarbonize our energy systems, I, I see green electrons replacing dirty electrons to power our buildings. Um, and the ma vast majority of the energy in cold climate buildings is for heating them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's for space heating. And I just think that this type of technology is, is an ideal solution for this kind of application. So I guess I'm sorry, are we saying that at this point, the opportunity with the technology is sort of manufacturing commercial applications and district heating for, for communities. And, and I guess the follow-up to be, what would be, what would it take to implement hydrogen, um, hydrogen-based district heating into existing infrastructure? Okay. So um, again, you know, we just simply make steam. And so the steam, if you want to use it for whatever you want to use it for, we make steam in a stationary way. We're not doing that. So if you want to use that in a steam boiler um, in a community, we make a fairly small size that that would work for. And you, and, you know, and I don't, I'm not an expert on hydrogen storage or transportation, but, you know, we make steam. We have an electrolyzer steam. We have an electrolyzer storage um, uh, boiler package, but um, you know, our smallest size would be would be about the right size for a community. And, you know, then we have larger sizes. But what we're getting a lot of pressure in the market for is the really big size, the 50 megawatt type size. Ours are nominally one me um, half a meg and one meg. Now we're going to five meg size. That's our next design. I don't know if I answered your question. Did I? Oh, no, this, this is great. Well, you know, okay. Aaron asked a question in the chat. You know, and the question was, you know, how do we start to adopt hydrogen boilers before the hydrogen infrastructure is in place? Well, that's that's an interesting thing. And that's one of the feasibility, one of the parts of feasibility studies we do for these large companies um, is where are we going to get the hydrogen? Yeah, we love your boiler. We, we want to do that. But where do we get all the hydrogen from? And typically it's either shipped in at this point on tankers. Well, you saw what the Japanese are doing. They're going all in um, or the, or it is made through electrolysis. Interestingly enough, um, very interestingly enough, we were in California and having a meeting and we decided to see, you know, because you can think of time shift or location shift. Right. So you can like your, like a storage solution. So we were there and, and we looked up what Cal uh, uh, Cal ISO was selling power for and it was negative. And so, but their, but their high rates on their peak use rates are 65 um, cents a kilowatt hour. So you can make your hydrogen and oxygen when it's cheap with your electrolyzer, run your electrolyzer, which is an energy hog, but then you get that energy back out. It's a, the overall system from electrolyzer to our end product is about 80% efficient. Most of that lost is in the electrolyzer. Electrolyzer, we lose about three percent just by the U value of the heat transfer. Excellent, excellent. Um, you know, so I uh, there's another follow up question here that uh, I learned a lot with that statement. Okay. Um, another question, sort of follow up here with Aaron is: Does it make more economic sense to use hydrogen for heat or for power? And she, the caveat said, I probably should probably do the calculation first, but here we go. Well, so we have, so if we use a CHP system and it's, we have another application where a client wants to use um, 
our, our, we call it a DCC, which is dynamic combustion chamber, but it's our boiler. They want to use that to make steam to do steam heating in a building. But if they have a problem with their steam or they have a problem with their electro, uh, elect, electric supply, they want to switch that over to electricity. And we can do that. Um, it's a better play to make steam and use steam. I don't know down. It would all depend on what your steam distribution system looked like and all that kind of stuff and where your losses were, but they're probably equally valuable. We're also doing, one thing I found was really interesting working with these colleges is they make steam and then they cool it down to run hot water around. Well, we're gonna replace that with just making hot water. And so yeah, I felt like, why, you know, why are you doing that? So, awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, I think might need to go over a quick point here. This question, please clarify 80% efficient starting at what point? The input electricity, I thought electrolyzer was 6% efficient going, getting to the H2. So the, well, that's based on what the electrolyzer people tell us their efficiency is. Okay. Our efficiency, we know to be about 96 and a half percent. And so they're telling us that their efficiencies are as high as 85%. So overall, our efficiency um, it's probably, I don't think it's 80. It's probably between 75 and 80. Right. Yeah, I'm, we're not. So while we have integrated the control scheme with plug powers electrolyzer as a starting point, um, we're not, you know, we're not trying to redesign theirs. Excellent. Yeah. I'm looking here as they come in. There must be energy loss due to compression and transportation too, right? Well, I'm sure there is. I mean, it, depending on where you get your uh, hydrogen and oxygen from, you're going to have transportation costs. When we model our, so, you know, there's an earth shot, or is it called a moon shot that the DOE is having one kilogram in one deck, one dollar kilogram in one decade. Well, we don't ever model one dollar kilogram. We're modeling it at two and a half to three because of compression and uh, transportation. So we take that in. That's still the cost driver is the compression and transportation. But we don't, we have met, we have managed our system that we, our inlet pressure is the same as the outlet pressure of the electrolyzer. But we don't, you know, we're not designing it that way. We're designing it for about a three hour storage between the two at about 40 bar. Coming out of the electrolyzer at 40 bar, going into our system at 40 bar with some storage or a, what we used to call a white spot in the line at 40 bar. Incredible. Incredible. You know, I, I think, you know, we we're getting close to the end here um, on, let me make sure I'm not really seeing any other uh, questions. If I've missed any, forgive me here. I don't think so. Um, you know, I'm excited. Do you, you have any any idea of what kind? I guess there's two questions. What is, you know, what, what are the next steps to see this sort of reality in our neighborhood? And then also stepping it back, what's the big thing about big picture and hydrogen for Alaska? I'd love to hear your take on the, the, the opportunity Alaska has with regards to hydrogen. Alaska, on the big picture. Alaska has, you know, stranded renewables, um, many, many renewables and very close proximity to Asia. Um, I think that there's an opportunity to harvest, the, use those renewables through electrolyzer to make hydrogen uh, and ship it. I mean, the Japanese have already invested a bunch of money, so they're very serious. When we're talking to Japan, they're, they're betting on $10 a kilogram hydrogen is what they're expecting to start. Now, everybody says, you know, we're working with a lot of early adopters who want to meet certain goals or have some other, you know, ideological reasons for, for jumping in soon. But every, but people generally expect, I think like a lot of the press presenters made the case that, that that cost will come down as infrastructure is built up. One of the things we find even difficult to find is, you know, um, manufacturers of pumps and valves that are experienced with hydrogen. So all that industry is nascent and um, should be, you know, growing up quickly with the reports we're getting, you know, out of the climate infra climate community. Well, this is exciting and I'd be excited. I'm, I'm excited to stay in touch with you and I'd like to hear, you know, this time next year, what would the conversation, how will it be a little different? Well, you can come to Scotland and have some of the whiskey that we're making. Um, <laughs> or, or we have we have a demonstration unit in Modesto. If anybody wants to come and see it work, I'm happy to invite you and have you come and host you and have you come out and see it work. Oh, that, that sounds lovely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Janet. Right. Thank and you. Thanks. Yeah, right, thank you all for the opportunity to be here. It was great to see everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me.
Stay safe. Take care. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Bruno. Um, that was a great presentation and a, a different use for hydrogen. Um, so, and very interesting. So we are now continuing with our last panel um, of session two, and this is our green or multicolored hydrogen panel. And it is my privilege to introduce uh, Mr. Chris Rose, an attorney and founder uh, and executive director of the Renewable Energy Alaska Project or REAP, which is well known across our state for its many accomplishments and uh, representation of diverse uh, stakeholder organizations. Um, Chris has worked um, all over the state. He's been hugely involved um, with many communities and with the Renewable Energy Fund um, and his list of accomplishments and influence uh, goes on. So without further ado, I will give the floor to Chris to introduce our speakers and moderate uh, this panel. Thank you, Chris, so much. We look forward to um, hearing your session. Well, thanks a lot, Aaron, and good day, everyone. Uh, I want to thank ASEP for organizing this workshop and for inviting me to participate. It's my pleasure to be here today and to moderate this panel, which is going to feature three presentations on different ways to produce hydrogen. First, we're going to hear from Joe Peach, Beach from Starfire Energy, who will talk about modular chemical plants for carbon-free production of ammonia and hydrogen. Uh, after Joe, we'll hear from Christian Rabidi from UltraSafe Nuclear Corporation, who will discuss using nuclear for hydrogen production. And finally, we'll hear from Matthew Story from the European Marine Energy Center, who's going to talk about producing hydrogen from tidal energy. We're going to try to hold the questions until all three speakers have finished. But if you have any burning questions that you know, clarify what a speaker has presented, we'll be happy to take those. When all three presenters are finished, we're hoping to have about a 30-minute discussion about how we can make, move, and store hydrogen, particularly in Alaska. Please remember to uh, write your questions in the chat. So we'll get going here with an introduction of Joe Beach. Uh, Joe is one of the founders of Starfire Energy. He switched its emphasis from solar energy to ammonia fuel in 2016. He is currently Starfire Energy's chief executive officer and chairman of its board of directors. He was previously a co-founder of a thin film a solar panel startup, some of whose technology can be seen in today's world-leading CDD solar panels. Joe received an MS and a PhD in applied physics from the Colorado School of Mines and a BS in both physics and physical education from UAF. When he lived in Fairbanks, he also took up cross-country skiing and hang gliding, and he served as a volunteer firefighter and emergency medical technician uh, in the China Goldstream Fire and Rescue. He's currently currently enjoys jogging, gardening, and making home wines. So welcome, Joe. You are on. Hi there. Uh, thank you. Let me uh, go ahead and share the... Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about uh, ammonia fuel, uh, why we might want it, and uh, how we can make it. Um, so this is a little bit of a different topic in a hydrogen conference. Uh, you know, it's not that we don't like hydrogen. In fact, we like hydrogen quite a bit. We use it to make ammonia. It's just that we have a different take on hydrogen than most people. Uh, we, we look at hydrogen as a, a superhero with a tragic weakness. Uh, you know, hydrogen superpower is that it's carbon free and we desperately need carbon free fuel. But it has, but it's allergic to a kryptonite and that kryptonite is storage and transport. And the, uh, the difficulties with hydrogen storage and transport are, are just related to its intrinsic properties. Uh, if, you, if you're working with the fuel, you really want it to be a liquid because it's easy to move around in pipes that way and it's a higher energy density that way. But for hydrogen, to make it a liquid, you have to chill it to minus 253C, which is literally colder than Pluto. I, you know, I looked it up, you know, low, low nighttime temperatures on Pluto, minus 233. Um, you, you could then, you could instead pressurize it, but it, it won't liquefy under pressure. Uh, so you end up doing, you know, high pressure storage, 10,000 PSI, which means you're doing a heavy steel tank or an expensive carbon fiber tank. Um, and then it's a very small molecule. It likes to leak. When it leaks, it has no odor, which means you have to have special equipment to detect the leaks, uh, which are required because it likes to ignite. Um, so these just add a lot of co codes and standards. It doesn't mean you can't use hydrogen safely. You definitely can. It just costs more to do it and takes a lot more effort. Um, so ammonia fixes these weaknesses. Uh, ammonia is uh, hydrogen is bonded to a nitrogen. 
and it liquefies very easily at minus 33 C. So it, you know, it's cold day in Alaska cold, not colder than Pluto cold. Um, or you can liquefy it with pressure uh, at 150 PSI, which is a, a very easily achieved pressure for liquef liquefaction. It's very similar to propane in, in these characteristics. It can be stored in inexpensive teal, steel tanks, shipped in inexpensive steel pipes, it has a very strong odor, which most people initially think is a bad thing for a fuel. It's actually a wonderful thing for a fuel. It's why we add mercaptan to natural gas so you can smell it. Uh, people can smell ammonia starting around 5 ppm. By the time you get to 15 ppm, everybody can smell it. And by the time you get to 50 parts per million, nobody wants to be around it. And what that means is those leaks get detected early and fixed when they're small. And then it also uh, it has a high ignition energy, so it's basically in, in, a, in a very narrow flammable range, so it's basically impossible to detonate. Uh, global infra infrastructure for shipping it around the world is already there. there you know, people have been moving ammonia in large quantities for about 100 years now by you know, truck, train, pipeline, and ship. Uh, all the codes and standards are in place. So what this leads to is when you're thinking energy storage, ammonia can provide practical terawatt hour energy storage. Uh, what I'm showing here are uh, three different energy storage methods. When people think energy storage, usually the first thing they think is batteries. That's one of the largest batteries uh, in the world there on the left, 129 megawatt hours, which seems like a lot until you think of grids needing gigawatt scale power generation which means that's minutes of energy storage for a grid. That's why batteries aren't really used for bulk energy storage on a grid. They're used for power management to control the ramp rates, not to actually provide huge amounts of energy. Uh, in the middle, we have hydrogen. That's the largest liquid hydrogen tank in the world at Cape Canaveral, uh, 9,000 megawatt hours. Uh, so now we're into you know, hours of energy storage for a grid, which is better. Uh, on the right is a, uh, ammonia tank, and it's a ho-hum ammonia tank. It, it, the tanks like this are used all around the world. Uh, 312,000 megawatt hours of chemical energy in that tank. So now we're into days, even beyond a week of energy storage for a grid. That's something you can use to make a fully stabilized carbon-free grid in association with wind and solar power. It's something you can use to make a fuel that can supply transportation and industrial heat applications in a cost-effective way. So you can move wind and solar beyond the grid into those applications that are hard to electrify. So we look at ammonia as being hydrogen's greater superhero child. You, you mix, you, you, you bond hydrogen to nitrogen, you get ammonia, it inherits hydrogen's carbon-free superpower, but it's not it, it's not susceptible to hydrogen storage and transport kryptonite. So we're getting a lot of industrial interest in this. Uh, you know, the, the traditional interest in ammonia is agriculture. You know, 80% of ammonia today goes into fertilizers, but that's actually the small part of, of the interest that we're seeing. Uh, we've got people that want to use ammonia as both an energy and a chemical in mining operations. We have people that are looking at decarbonizing global uh, maritime shipping by replacing bunker fuel with ammonia. You know, people looking at grid storage, uh, either fired in gas turbines or in uh, duct burner plants. They can start by co-firing with coal, and then they're you know, like Japan intends to replace coal entirely with ammonia by 2050. Uh, and then you can also use ammonia as a hydrogen carrier to conveniently and cost effectively get hydrogen to end use applications where you can turn it back into hydrogen for storage on the vehicle. So we have three products we're developing. Uh, the first one, uh, well, we have three products because because they share underlying technologies like the, the catalyst, the mechanical support for the catalyst, an adsorbent uh, and adsorbent regeneration method. Uh, it's uncommon for a startup to have three products, but because we have these shared underlying technologies, our investors told us to go for all three. Um, the first one is Rapid Ramp. That's a, a modular carbon-free ammonia production that's designed to work with variable power. That's something that conventional ammonia plants can't do. 
The second one is Prometheus Fire. Its purpose is to crack ammonia to make a, a blend of hydrogen and ammonia that can burn a lot like natural gas or other fuels. And then the last one is Prometheus Hydrogen. Its purpose is to take ammonia and convert it into high pressure, high purity hydrogen, uh, mainly for fuel cell applications, although there's increasing interest in injecting hydrogen into gas pipelines. Um, the rapid ramp, an important thing about it is that it's a modular system. So we uh, take each unit process and uh, scale it up to a, si to a capacity that fits inside a Connex shipping container footprint. Um, then we mass produce those shipping containers on assembly lines, a lot like how you build cars. Um, this, uh, our technology has 100% turndown capability, which means it can run at full power, at full capacity, but it can also be ramped down to match the available power. Uh, conventional ammonia plants take uh, several days to start up. We can start up in a few hours. Um, and by taking this approach, this modular approach, we uh, can build plants of basically any size. You can use a few modules to have a small plant. You can use many, many modules to have a large plant. Um, RIP is bound up mainly in the reactor. We have a proprietary catalyst, proprietary uh, reactor design, and in the adsorber, um, which is something that sets us apart from Haber-Bosch. Haber-Bosch uses a condenser to remove ammonia from the product stream. In our case, we use an adsorber to remove ammonia from the product stream. And this gives us a huge process flexibility because we can remove ammonia at basically any partial pressure of ammonia. That lets us operate at a tenth the, a tenth the pressure of conventional ammonia production. So we have IP in, in the adsorbent and also in the means of regenerating the adsorbent. Um, I mentioned mass producing these modules. You know, some people view the mass production as icing on the cake. Uh, it's really, it's the flour that's in the cake. It's vitally important. And the reason is something that's called Wright's Law or the experience curve. So uh, what I'm showing here is observed in many, many industries uh, in manufacturing. And that's that as you mass produce something for each doubling of cumulative production, you see like a five to 30% reduction in unit cost. So as examples, the top left, uh, that's the cost reduction seen by Ford when during the first seven years of building the Model T. Uh, over the course of those seven years, they had about a 70% reduction in their unit costs. Uh, the figure in the lower right is for solar panels. Uh, 1976, they were at about $70 per watt. By the time they got to 2005, they're at more like $5 per watt. Today, they're at 35 cents per watt. Uh, so literally a factor of 200 cost reduction. That's all tied to the, the effects of mass production in both improving your supply chain, reducing your cost in your supply chain, having lots of clever people that are well-funded, looking at how to improve the product, and having lots of clever people looking at how to improve the manufacturing process. And you put all these together and cost reductions always happen. And this is how we will get to distributed ammonia fuel production that's affordable at a broad range of scales. Now, Prometheus Fire is our ammonia cracking for combustion applications. Uh, what's different about it is conventional ammonia cracking uh, operates at 900 degrees centigrade or higher. We can operate at five to 600 degrees C. That means we can use the exhaust heat from a combustion process to drive the cracking reaction, which means we basically have no energy penalty for, for the cracking. And that has a great deal of appeal to people that are building gas turbines and duct burners for power plants. Um, so uh, that's a, a primary industry we're focusing on there. Uh, we've demonstrated the ammonia blend in, the, in our facility, and other people have demonstrated this as well. What you're seeing there is a 70% ammonia, 30% cracked ammonia blend burning in a commercial natural gas burner that we just replumbed for the ammonia and, and cracked ammonia. So that's carbon-free fire. There's no CO2 emissions at all coming from that. Um, we had a, a NOx, uh, well, an emissions analyzer on it, and we saw NOx levels that are similar to using methane in the same burner, something around 100 parts per million. 
that's a concentration that um, can be easily treated with existing selective catalytic reduction technologies to meet whatever uh, regulatory standards are in the, the jurisdiction. Uh, Prometheus hydrogen builds upon Prometheus fire. Uh, it has the same cracking technology, but then it adds in an adsorbent uh, downstream of the cracker. Uh, that adsorbent comes from our rapid ramp technology. So it's, it's you know, using the technology in multiple places. Um, what the adsorbent does is it removes any residual ammonia from the cracked gas stream because inevitably there's some residual ammonia in combustion. You don't really care about it, but in hydrogen applications, you do. So uh, you remove the ammonia, it can get recirculated to the cracker. Downstream of the adsorber, you just have hydrogen and nitrogen. That can go to an electrochemical compressor, which is 100% selective for hydrogen. Uh, so it sends the nitrogen to the atmosphere and outputs uh, over 5.9's purity hydrogen at pressures up to 800 bar, and which is what you need for passenger vehicle applications and far greater than what you need for other applications. And this will have a, a modular construction similar to rapid ramp where the modules are mass produced in factories. So that's in a nutshell why we're doing ammonia and, and how we're doing ammonia. And uh, I'll be happy to uh, answer questions during the panel discussion. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Joe. Appreciate it. Are there any burning questions that we need to answer right now? Otherwise, we'd like to wait until we get uh, through with all three speakers. Okay, I'm not. I'm not seeing any. Um, thanks again, Joe. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Christian Rabidi. He joined uh, UltraSafe Nuclear Corporation in May of this year as Director of Technology Strategy. He's currently focused on developing the U.S. market and framing the micromodular reactor technology in the context of integrated energy systems. He's also engaged in the modeling and simulation activities of the company for the licensing of micromodular reactors. Before joining uh, USNC, uh, Dr. Abidi worked at Idaho National Laboratory. There, he led the development and application of tools for a techno-economic analysis of integrated energy systems. And he explored how nuclear energy could be used to achieve a decarbonized and affordable U.S. energy system. Previously, he was involved in software tool development for nuclear reactor core simulations. Before joining Idaho National Lab, he spent a few years as a neutron transport software developer at Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, Dr. Rabidi received his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Stuttgart in Germany and an executive MBA from the IE Business School in Madrid. Please welcome Dr. Rabidi. I think you're muted. Sorry, didn't realize that. Uh, but thank you for the kind introduction. I'm very excited actually to be here. And um, well, first of all, I, I have to say that uh, we are not a company developing hydrogen production, right? So our business is the business of uh, uh, producing heat or electricity. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I believe that the heat and electricity, you know, for me, you know, I heard in the past a lot of time that, uh, you know, electrons have no color. Uh, maybe it's not exact to the uh, statement. I think that uh, um, we can work together with uh, um, variable renewable, with hydrogen, and we all need to contribute and to create an ecosystem that is optimal for uh, the hydrogen economy or anyhow to achieve a net zero uh, economy. So uh, I will start the presentation. So just a couple of words about the company. If you can go to the next slide. All right. So we are still a startup. Um, startup defined by the fact that uh, uh, we we have not we don't have revenue, uh, but uh, the nuclear business definitely is not an easy undertaking. So we are already fairly big, uh, more than two hundred people actually at this point in time, and we focus both on the um, commercial micro reactors. I don't know if any of you have heard the news about uh, some work that we have started uh, in Alaska. Uh, and we have also branched the company for space application. Um, the, the, today I'm going to talk mainly about the micromodular reactor, which is a reactor exactly designed for remote application. 
um, is a small unit that actually can be daisy chained in multiple units, cheap, quite size, uh, quite large size in terms of power. But the, the initial market was uh, exactly the remote application. So uh, I think that this is the synergy and the right fit with the, the Alaska environment. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, thank you. This is our unit. Uh, just to give you a feeling, this is pretty much, I think, 30, uh, a little bit less, about 20 yards tall. Uh, it's underground. Um, as I said, we're, the, the, the main purpose is producing heat. So this is, in reality, a battery. It is something that uh, contains about 3 billion kilowatt hour of energy. And you can use it uh, at any time you like. It doesn't need to be continuous. Uh, could be, you know, during the day, uh, stopping during the night, or could be even stopping for seasons. Uh, so there is a lot of flexibility. Uh, really, the main concept that makes us, you know, kind of different from the old concept of nuclear is the fact that uh, it's a, a, a energy storage, a very, very long energy storage, because uh, if depending on the rate at which you take electricity or energy, generally speaking, from the reactor, it's going to last at least for 10 years, probably 20, if low capacity factor, even 40 years. So that is the amount of time that you will have available electricity or energy whenever you like. If you can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is giving an example how small and uh, uh, how flexible the installation would be. Uh, this is about 200 yard by 100 yard, and this is a two unit plant. Uh, the, the plant is waterless, so we have no need to be located close by a source of water you know, over the whole year. Um, the other thing that uh, is important for what I'm going to introduce later is the fact we also, in our design, include a storage system with molten salt which gives us the flexibility to be uh, to go under 20% of the nominal power of the plant. And, uh, you know, uh, it helps also the ramp down because we can use that times for the accumulation of energy. So overall, this is a two unit example, 200 yard, 400 yard. And as you can notice, the reactor is underground. So this, you know, helps in terms of uh, uh, flexibility of the location of the, the, the plant because, you know, being underground is less sensitive to earthquake, uh, and uh, it, it's uh, also protect the reactor from you know um, from possible uh, misuse. Uh, let's say in this way. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. So here is where I try to establish a bridge with you know the hydrogen community. So as I said, we provide heat, we provide electricity. So what what is the quality of what we do? Um, and so in the reason for providing this information is really to, uh, to um, say to the hydrogen community, hey, uh, you know, uh, we would like you to think about our technology and how it could be best utilized for um, your technology in terms of production, which could be steam internal forming, could be electrolyzer, and so on. So, so allow me to give you a little bit of information. So the reactor would provide heat, um, I would say uh, from the molten salt about 550C, uh, from directly from the reactor about 600, 650C. And this is very flexible machine. So you can actually ramp it down, ramp it up pretty quickly. So it's flexible to respond to load changes. And uh, I'll, I'll mention it uh, more deeply later, but the, the idea is that hydrogen, nuclear, uh, peakers based on, on hydrogen, they call all work together uh, to stabilize the grid and at the end of the day to meet demand. Technology per se is uh, currently designed in a very conservative fashion because we, you know, it's important to us to be available soon. Uh, but we know that this technology has been around uh, for quite some time and uh, um, and uh, we can achieve much higher temperature if that will be necessary to be a better match for some of the technology that we have seen today. Uh, next slide. So now I'll, I'll go through briefly a couple of uh, ideas that we have considered and you know they have been proposed to us in order how to 
uh, integrate better with the, the hydrogen production. So first of all, from uh, um, this actually comes from my previous work when I was at the end of the National Laboratory. So the, the high temperature steam electrolyzer, uh, they tend to be quite capital intensive, in some sense, very similar to nuclear industry, right? We are very capital intensive too. So for the same reason, we like to be very, um, with very high capacity factors. Um, you know, the, the loss of capacity factor really impact very negatively the cost of hydrogen and for us, the cost of energy that we produce. Uh, so in this respect, we really believe that uh, um, the, the, the teaming of uh, uh, HTSC technology with nuclear is a good one, exactly because we can create uh, an island where we have a good match in terms of capacity factor and dispatchability factor. So I make this, this distinction in terms of availability and capacity factor. So sometimes when you look to the statistics, you see that you know, a nuclear reactor has 95% capacity factor. Well, you know that's a capacity factor, but it's not really reflecting uh, why we shut down. And as, as, as every complex machine, we need our you know, time off to, to, to uh, do maintenance, but these are all scheduled events. Uh, so in terms of uh, being available, the availability of a nuclear reactor is both 99%. Um, the other thing is that, uh, um, as I mentioned before, our technology is highly modular. So we're talking about um, terms megawatt thermal uh, between 15 and 30 megawatt thermal. And we can actually easily chain this, this um, uh, reactor to achieve higher power levels. But I think that that, that concept fits very well uh, with the, the, the concept of the modularity of the HTSC. So HTSC is modular as we are, and we are probably pursuing the same type of approach in terms of cost reduction. I used to say that this is, you know, this is the first time the nuclear energy will try to take advantage of uh, um, economy of units rather than economy of scale. So not very large reactor, but uh, uh, small and many. In this way, we will be able to, to reduce costs quickly by a, a very fast learning uh, cycle. Uh, just to give you an example, you know, a, a large light reactor will be in the range of a, a one gigawatt, so in terms of electric, so that will be equivalent at least to 1,000 of these small modular reactors. So think about the learning that can happen in the creation of 1,000 models with respect to one large reactor. Um, so I also realized though that so far, the study that I've seen in terms of the HTSC, um, they don't really uh, look in the range of temperature like the 600C that we spoke about. Uh, a lot of them, they focus on much lower uh, feed temperature or much higher. So I think that there is room for further research in this area to create a better um, you know, coupling between the two technology. Now, if you can go to the next slide, this is something that I already mentioned uh, very quickly, but uh, you know, here what you can see in the, in the upper plot is actually the load in Texas, uh, the hourly uh, electricity demand, and in the bottom, you can see three plots, three lines, which represent uh, the two peak. One is the summer, one in the the the, um, the winter peak, and one is, uh, I think, is the shoulder months. I think in the spring. Um, so this is just to 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 focus on the volatility of the demand of the electricity demand. And again, let's not think about the big grid as Texas. This type of volatility happens even in microgrid, right? Actually, microgrid is even more difficult to diversify uh, the supply, and therefore, these volatility are even more difficult to manage um, with, uh, within a microgrid. So, this is big. So, why I'm saying I'm pointing out this is because the um, reality is that if you have available solar, and uh, wind, these are very cheap, uh, but uh, availability uh, is uh, lower. Uh, and uh, the capability to cover the demand, especially in a microgrid setting, becomes challenging. Now, if instead you start thinking 
uh, an ecosystem where you have hydrogen production, fuel cell, maybe gas, you know, um, hydrogen turbines. Uh, you can produce um, uh, hydrogen in the downtime period. You can uh, use battery or the energy storage system that the reactor comes with. So essentially, you have a complex ecosystem, and everybody's providing a service, which is a little bit different one from the other. Um, we have uh, done actually studies on these, and we can show that uh, there is a decrease in the overall system cost, depending which technology you are integrating. Uh, so I think that this could be uh, something very interesting to, to understand uh, and, um, you know, in terms of the, the microgrid situation. Alaska is a possible example. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. So I stole actually this line from actually a former colleague of mine at the IDO National Laboratory. Maybe some of you knows him already, Richard Gorman. I had the pleasure to work with him for many years. And this was a presentation that he gave in Wyoming, one of the slides. Um, so right now, I think blue hydrogen is the one that seems to be uh, the, the highest TRL uh, in terms of technology. Is it gonna be a bridging technology? Is it gonna be the final technology? I don't know. But my, the main point is that uh, uh, is a technology that uh, definitely will play a role in my mind. And uh, uh, there is a, a lot of heat needs in this technology. So the integration with a nuclear reactor, I think that should be more uh, further investigated uh, because we have the capability to provide either base load or ramping capability uh, at um, fairly high temperature. So that would, allow to save um, some of the CO2 uh, emission uh, from the steam and reforming process. Of course, there is carbon sequestration, uh, but the reduction of use of methane is always a good thing in terms of uh, avoiding the leaks, which so far seems to be unavoidable and has a very large impact in the greenhouse, green, uh, greenhouse gas uh, life cycle emission. And uh, the other thing is that uh, um, the, the carbon sequestration needs to be deployable uh, and not everywhere. So we go back uh, to the fact that uh, um, this system could be also deployed uh, in an in, in industrial complex that they don't simply have access to uh, the CO2 pipeline, as was mentioned in the previous session, um, So, which actually imply a large capital costs. Um, so... Uh, I think that this concludes my presentation, and I will welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, are there any burning questions that folks would like to add, uh, ask right now? Otherwise, we're going to save these for the end. Um, I saw a couple interesting questions, but I think we can move on. Um, thanks again, Christian. We'll, we'll, we'll be back with you in a moment. Uh, our last speaker today is Matt Story. Welcome, Matt. Matt is the Hydrogen Development Manager at the European Marine Energy Center, the world's first and leading facility for demonstrating testing of wave and tidal energy converters. Matt's focus is the development of EMEC's hydrogen business through attracting grant funding and winning commercial work and developing EMEC's hydrogen strategy. He has a background in technical project management, sustainability and business strategy, and within the hydrogen, ocean energy, and construction industries. Uh, he will be leading the public funding works for EMEC, and he's also the Floda Hydrogen Hub's primary point of contact for this work. So welcome, Matt. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, uh, firstly, I'd just like to say I really appreciate the chance to, to come here and speak, and also um, really quite honored and taken aback by the, by the other panelists as well, and, and fantastic to be to be speaking um, next to them. So that, that's fantastic. I do apologize if I'm slouching down a bit. I am currently midway through a 48 hour journey from Orkney to California. So in a time until seat in a hotel somewhere in Aberdeen Airport for reasons which will become apparent. So I'm gonna be talking about EMEC and particularly our hydrogen journey, which has been, I guess the latest uh, bit of what EMEC has been looking to do within the renewable energy um, uh, sphere. But I think. Before I do that, it's probably important and interesting, well, hopefully interesting, to understand a bit more about who we are and where we're based. So this is the United Kingdom on the left, and Orkney, or the Orkney Isles, 
but not the Orkneys. They, they don't like that. And the series of islands which are situated just off the north coast of Scotland. And you can see that again, a bit more zoomed in on the, 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 the right hand, hand image. That's where we work principally, although we do a bit, bit of work um, elsewhere in the Europe, Europe and the US, but it is where the majority of our people and our infrastructure are based. And it is yeah, really quite critical and it underpins what we do. And there's a reason it's taken me 24 hours of traveling and I'm still not outside of the UK yet. Um, in terms of what we do, it's, it, it is very much firmly rooted in, in our sort of island um, context. So our sort of history is within a renewable energy um, but with a particular fo focus on tidal and wave energy. And we've been doing that for around 21 years. And we offer sites and a series of facilities and expertises which allow developers to come and to actually you know, test their kit, basically. That, that's what they can do. It's good. We're grid connected. And, um, uh, and that's really sort of underpins all of our activities. We have quite, I say quite recently, over the last sort of five years, six years or so, really started to move much more um, directly into the hydrogen space. And for some quite... Um, quite specific reasons for which I'm going to come on to. And this is sort of important to understand in the context of, of how we work in Orkney. So we have a lot of renewable opportunities up in Orkney. We have a uh, lot of development um, around uh, some traditional wind, offshore wind and floating wind, but also a very significant um, a tidal stream um, resource, as well as, as wave, which is yet to sort of be fully developed and also a number of other opportunities as well. So that's sort of the base. But then the challenge is that we have a constrained grid. Um, we have a, a, a really quite um, insignificant uh, connected grid uh, back to the north of Scotland, which just doesn't allow us to effectively um, remove essentially that renewable energy uh, from Orkney, which means we have to get a bit more creative with what we do with it. And the, th the third thing is that we've got some quite significant, uh, quite, yeah, some quite significant um, carbon impacts as well. And they are very much focused on transport, intra-island transport, but also the heating of our homes. So that sort of creates quite an interesting situation where we have a lot of energy available, but also some quite significant sort of carbon challenges. And it's really that which laid the groundwork to remit to begin to get involved in the hydrogen space. So first and foremost, we saw hydrogen, the hydrogen opportunity, as an opportunity to, to use um, that currently or that previously constrained uh, resource to produce green hydrogen. But, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward idea, really. We, we use it essentially as a, as a proxy energy store. Um, and then there was various different um, you know, initial plans about what, what could then be done with the hydrogen, whether we would use it as an energy store and then put it back into the grid from through one way or another as appropriate, use it for transportation or, or, or any any other of the, the many uses which you you will probably all know a lot better about than I do. But after a while we 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 started fitted it fitted in a little bit more into a, a strategic way of thinking about it. And we very much now are focusing on, on our sort of hydrogen production to support the sort of demonstration projects that we were doing previously, but now with a more of a hydrogen angle. So again, developers being able to come up um, to Orkney, up to EMEC and actually test different aspects of the hydrogen value chain, the hydrogen ecosystem um, within Orkney, which is, which is pretty cool. And again, something which is relatively unique as well and very, very, um, very good from the, the R&D side. Um, so pardon me, so to phrase a bit. In terms of where we get involved as EMAC, and I'll go into onto some of our sort of specific projects in, in a minute, we try and cover as much as a value chain uh, as possible. And I think we probably get most of it, but we do tend to take relatively neutral roles. We're never going to be setting ourselves up as a um, sort of industrial size hydrogen export, so not, not within EMAC at least, maybe some, with some of our partners or projects we're involved in. We are looking at electrolysis and primary production for, for sort of um, for, for, for research and demonstration projects. We're also very focused on the storage and handling side. We've done an awful lot of work around uh, the safe bunkering of hydrogen and also the, 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 so the road transportation as, as well. I'm working very closely um, with particularly UK uh, regulators to, to really allow, to, to, to allow and, and to support the maturity of the, sort of the regulation legislation side, which has been a real challenge. 
um, so far with, with hydrogen. And the third bit of the jigsaw that we, we do is we tend to support um, on a sort of a techno, techno, uh, techno and feasibility level, getting, getting involved and in supporting new um, companies entering the industry, um, using our sort of technical, technical expertise and experience uh, to, to begin to sort of share that and, and help them get involved. So I'm hoping you might by now be interested as to what we actually have on Orkney. Now, now bear in mind, Orkney is not a particularly big place. We have around 20,000 people who live there, and the majority of which live on this island on the bottom of the Orkney mainland, and then the rest are sort of scattered fairly evenly throughout the outer islands. So we have uh, two primary locations uh, for electrolysis, one on the Isle of Edie and one on the island of Shappen, uh, Shappensee. The one on the island of Shappensee is um, powered by a community wind turbine, uh, which is locally, uh, locally owned by the community, as the name suggests. And the one on ED is connected into both a community wind turbine, but also into our grid connected um, tidal stream site in this uh, section of water between ED and the next island uh, to the southwest, which is for the full awareness. And that's where EMEC does a lot of its, um, the majority of our tidal work. In addition to the, the production, we also have um, a series of tube trailers which transport the hydrogen um, around the island, as well as a number of different offtake solutions, including fuel cells, um, hydrogen refueling stations, um, a, a combined heat power plant at the local airport, um, and various other sort of facilities which support um, with, with, with the shoring of uh, craft. And this is, and it's probably worth pointing out, this isn't something that EMF have done themselves by by any means this has been a really big collaborative pro uh, project and you'll see i suspect a number of names that you may, may be relatively familiar with already and um through sort of european uh, funding that's really underpinned uh, these activities really supported the work that we've been able to do it's been incredibly important for us and obviously within the current environment in the uk an important thing for us to be able to um replace as well of particular interest, and I, I, I mentioned our ED project, is um, the ITEC project, which is, a, again, an EU-funded uh, bit of work, where we are integrating hydrogen electrolysis into um, the um, tidal turbine that you can see up, in, uh, up on the screen, which is called the Orbital O2 device, along with um, flow cell battery storage and some pretty intelligent energy management systems to be essentially providing a, a mini a mini grid uh, system to to allow to make some intelligent decisions as to what that primary energy should most effectively be used to do. Should we be storing it in batteries? Should we be producing hydrogen? Should we be exporting to the grid? And that's a that, that's a real that's a really interesting project for us, and and also supports a number of different sort of bolt-ons, which particularly support the the EMS side of it actually. And it's a great, a great example of how having a demo, you know, having a series of demonstrations can then, you know, sort of follow on to different things. Um, but yeah, that, that that's been that's been really a really interesting one for us, and particularly as it combines our expertise of using tidal and hydrogen into some into one um, one project. Away a bit from the production side, one of the areas that we're really really interested in is the decarbonisation of shipping. I think going back to my point about some of the Orkney Island context. The carbon impact of local shipping on Orkney is huge and actually prevent, provides both a massive risk but also a big opportunity in terms of actually how we, how we go about um, decarbonising that. Um, this project, which is called HIMAT, which is, I'm not going to read out the whole name, you can read it on the screen, essentially is testing a series of different hydrogen uh, concepts. So there's a hydrogen co uh, combustion to, to provide um, conventional propulsion, uh, harbicides, um, uh, um, hydrogen engine for, for, for powering and ensuring a crew welfare unit. And uh, then there's uh, demonstration of hydrogen storage on board, but also then the use of the hydrogen to, for fuel cell for auxiliary power. And also a fair bit of work as well, looking at the infrastructure requirements for what would happen if this was to be rolled out to, you know, to, onto a different scale. And we see this as a real pathway into, into sort of marine decarbonization. There's a, as we all know, there's a big discussion as to whether Hydrogen as a gas is the most appropriate form of doing that. But projects like this are really setting up to try and answer that question and, and sort of add to the zeitgeist um, on that point. Um, possibly a little bit le of less interest in this, this specific presentation. We also do a lot um, with 
sort of larger research projects as well. And we, 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 we try to replicate what's been done in Orkney or support other people, should I say, to replicate what's been done in Orkney, such as in this case in the Netherlands um, and on Mallorca. I think I'm probably getting near to the end of my timeline. So I just want to talk about a couple of our big things that are coming up. So I just mentioned the High, High Met project, but we'll be soon moving on to the next bit, which we're going to imaginatively call High Met 2. And we're hoping that that is going to be the taking of a sort of a, an initial demonstration project into scale, into real scale, and with the potential of looking at a hydrogen or hydrogen derivative powered fleet. Um, and that would be huge for decarbonisation in the world, and hopefully also other Scottish islands. And then also there's a state two project, and this is our EMEX other focus area on shipping is on decarbonisation of aviation. And this is setting up Kirkwall, which is a local town's airport, to become a um, sort of a hub of expertise for aviation decarbonisation. EMEX are a big part of that, and that's really, really interesting. And um, potentially can bring an awful lot of um, you know, technical expertise, employment and support to the local, uh, local economy as well. So I think that's me. Um, I hope there's some things which resonate, particularly within your sort of Alaska context, although I know that people will be from all over the world and delighted and, and so really are looking forward to the panel discussion as well. Thank you very much, Matt. So we will um, go ahead and start a discussion here. Uh, I, I think we're really talking about how we're making, moving and transporting hydrogen. Um, and for instance, moving hydrogen in the form of ammonia is not moving hydrogen, but it's moving it anyway in, in different forms. So we're, we're I, I'm very interested in to hear what questions you may have of each other before we get going from questions from the, the audience. Um, any questions from panelists to each other? Because I, I'm sure this is uh, some of this is new to you and it's also um, technology that you are obviously uh, in some ways competing. Any, any? Well, I wouldn't say we're competing. Um, we, we need energy and uh, whether it's small modular nuclear or whether it's tidal uh, or whether it's wind or solar, you know, we, we need the energy to, to make the fuel. So we're, um, you know, aligned in that way. You know, and, you know, so we'd be happy to supply equipment to, you know, people with the power to make the ammonia. Oh, absolutely. Um, I guess what I, what I was talking about is that there's a lot of emerging technologies here that are all trying to get out in front um, and, and uh, certainly understand, have, have a public understanding of them. And maybe that's a question for all of you. Um, since hydrogen is not well known uh, to the average citizen and even maybe the average policymaker, um, how do you think your companies or institutions are moving toward um, that public education that I think is going to be necessary for people to understand why this can be part of our energy future? And I take, take it from any of you. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I can't speak to the, to the degree of rolling it out to the UK probably, but what we've, what we've seen in Orkney, now we've been there for five or six years, and particularly with the, the quite tangible um, things that we're doing, such as, for instance, a hydrogen refueling station, we are quite quickly beginning to see people both curious but also buying into the, into the concept. Well, that's both good and bad. On the good side, it means that people are going to feel more comfortable with hydrogen. On the flip side, if we don't deliver, we don't succeed, people will probably go the other way and become quite cynical with it. Um, we, but we have found that sort of visibility and, and I guess a bit of an intelligent uh, local engagement and branding has been pretty effective. Um, but again, that's within 20,000 people. That's not a, a massive sample size. Thanks. So my comment would be that actually, yeah, as I said, we are not producers of hydrogen per se. And I, I think that uh, there is a lot of hydrogen already used. In the, in the industry as it is today. And, you know, even managing to decarbonize that, that will be a huge achievement. You know, this is a thing that, uh, you know, without looking to expand, I think that uh, even looking to decarbonize what we are already using as hydrogen, that will be a huge contribution to the reduction of the CO2 emission. Absolutely. Joe, you have anything to add on that? Yeah, in our case, honestly, the the U.S. is is 
behind. Uh, you know, we get the most support in uh, Japan, South Korea, Europe. You know, those are the places that are looking to import chemical energy. And you know, Japan led the pack. They they did a study. You know, the government sponsored study. You know, looking at liquid hydrogen versus ammonia versus uh, um, liquid organic uh, hydrogen carriers and ammonia came out on top. And that is what sparked off the, the global interest in ammonia as a fuel. Um, and now you're, you're seeing similar, uh, well, once you have that interest, now you're seeing export hubs develop, you know, in Australia and uh, South America, Middle East uh, and the Great Plains in North America are all big possibilities. And honestly, Alaska is one too, you know, that there's a lot of coastal wind that, and, and you know, the, the location is good for serving Asian markets. Um, so it, it, in our case, on a policy perspective, it's being driven by Asia and Europe. And from an investment perspective, it's being driven by industry. You know, most of our investors are strategic investors that are wanting to be first into the party. One of the questions that uh, was raised about <clears throat> the technology that you talked about, uh, Joe, was um, what the round trip efficiencies were for uh, power to ammonia to power. Yeah. So, uh, you know, round trip power to ammonia to power, you'll probably be in the 20 to 25% realm on round trip. Now, the key thing to remember is that round trip is not the right metric. Uh, when people go to the gas station to fuel up their car, nobody in the world asks what's the efficiency from well to pump for this uh, fuel that I am buying. They just want to know what's the stuff cost. Right. And that that is the metric of interest. And that's where uh, when you want to get into long-term energy storage, batteries may have 70, 80% round trip efficiency, but if you want to store the power for months, they are ungodly expensive. So uh, you got to look at the right metric. Uh, we're not trying to compete with batteries on storage for minutes. You know, we want to provide storage for days, weeks, months, and be able to time shift it for weeks and months across the year. And that's something that batteries just don't do. Thank you. Uh Christian, I want to ask you a little bit about the, the work that your company is uh, considering in Alaska, out in Glen Allen, and um, how that, if it were to go forward, um, whether or not there, there might be some applications there or whether or not Golden Valley Electric is considering applications um, to use the, the electricity and the heat that you produce to, to make hydrogen. At this point, not that I'm aware of. I guess that you know, Copper Valley is a utility. They have their needs, and uh, so we're, we're addressing those at this point, which is essentially the, the looking to um, you know meet the demand of their customer, right? Okay. Uh, one of the things I think that you talked about, Christian, is you know the the availability and the capacity factor of nuclear, as opposed to, for instance, uh, variable renewables. Of course, with tidal. It might be variable, but uh, it's also very predictable. Right. And so I'm, and uh, and I also kind of understood from what Joe was presenting that uh, there's a lot of technologies now that are moving toward um, smaller, uh, smaller increments, lower pressures, lower temperatures, uh, perhaps lower capacity factors. Just kind of curious um, where you all see us moving with making hydrogen um, with variable renewables and, and what technologies might uh, really create a breakthrough with that? I, I think that uh, I would like to start saying that, I, as I pointed out, I don't see a competition. I see more teamwork, um, you know, capacity factor, capital cost versus variable cost. These are all variables that enter into the mix. And we have to understand uh, what is the best mix that will not kill the cost by having low capacity factors, uh, but at the same time will take advantage of the fact that the LCOE of some sources are very low. So I think that is really about designing the optimal system. And you know, 
I think if there would have been a solution to get cheap electricity, green, uh, capable to meet the load, uh, this problem would be a, would have solved you know 20 years ago, right? So I think that, that, that there is it's really the optimization uh, of a very complex system, and so we should start looking to all the possible solutions all together and try to come up with the best portfolio. Thanks. Um, question for Matt that just came in. Uh, to please elaborate a little bit on the uh, applications for aviation that you mentioned toward the end of your presentation. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, it's a really interesting one, actually. It's a little bit, a little bit like shipping. It's, we're not quite sure in terms of what the what the the the, the right sort of fuel sources are yet. Yeah, there's definitely a place for battery powered airplanes um, for for short haul flights, which I think is which is referred to the question. I think the, the role of hydrogen could well be in sort of hydrogen-based synthetic um, synthetic fuels. Basically, we've got a few projects where we, we, we're supporting um, partners who are sort of looking in this area to the use of green hydrogen to create sort of synthetic air fuels. Um, that, that seems to be a sensible approach. There, there, there also could be a role for, so for, for hydrogen itself in a sort of gaseous state, but it, it probably is more of a, a bridge or it's more of a, a niche application, but as I said, battery for short haul flights and um, and and hydrogen for the production of the sort of fuel would seem to be the yeah would seem to be the most sensible um, approach we think at the moment. And Joe, what what about uh, ammonia as a fuel? My, my understanding is that ammonia was used as a fuel long time ago. Um, are there uh, is there a renewed interest you are, that you're saying with using as ammonia as a direct fuel? Absolutely, yes. Um, the International Maritime Organization and also South Korean uh, shipping organizations have both identified ammonia as the lowest cost decarbonization route for maritime shipping. Um, you know, it, it's really coming down to methanol and ammonia. Methanol seems to have a short term advantage, and ammonia has the long term advantage there. Um, in Japan, there, there's a huge amount of interest in gas turbines using ammonia as the fuel and duct burners in, in coal power plants using ammonia as the fuel. Um, and then there's also uh, solid oxide fuel cells can use ammonia directly as a fuel. And those are uh, being integrated into a, a shipping demonstration um, in Northern Europe where you know, it's electric drive ship and part of its power will come from the ammonia fuel cells and part of it will come from a, a diesel engine. Um, you know, so these things are all going on. Um, so, so yeah, the interest is actually quite high uh, for both uh, direct ammonia fuel use and conversion of ammonia to hydrogen uh, for other applications as well. Thanks. Uh, another question uh, for Christian, um, and, and this relates to uh, uh, a reference to Toshiba turbine. Um, now, there was a Toshiba turbine that was discussed up in Alaska for a long time, um, maybe as long as 20 years ago. Uh, yeah, if you're, if you're familiar with it, uh, the question is, how, how is your technology different than that? And maybe you could just go ahead and elaborate a little bit more about wow. just maybe not spend so much time with how it's different, but let's a little bit more elaboration on, on your technology and, and some of the, uh, you know, the breakthroughs that your technology has made. Yeah. So at the time, if I, um, if I understand correctly, the project that you're referring for was the 4S reactor. It was a fast reactor, uh, very different technology from what we are using right now. So first of all, um, USNC is, technology is based on a very, a very special type of fuel. It's called uh, fully encapsulated, microencapsulated um, triso fuel. Uh, and in this type of fuel, uh, the uranium fissile material is coated with three layers of carbon silicon carbide which by, you know, is the, like the third hardest material uh, known. And then it, that is also uh, within a small pellets, a small cylinder of sil pure silicon carbide, fully dense. So it's a very completely innovative technology. Uh, the, the idea of this fuel came right after Fukushima, uh, when the industry wondered uh, 
And actually, our CEO was part of, uh, you know, key part uh, of that process, wondered if we could come up with uh, a concept of fuel that would be resistant to any any accident scenario that we can actually think of. So um, uh, that, that, that it is fundamentally different. Plus, in addition to that, this reactor has a very, very low power density. So it's a walk away safe reactor, which means that essentially without any operator intervention, any active action, the reactor will actually stay as it is. Will not need anyone to, you know, to fix the problem, right? Um, so what was the second question you asked? So I, I think you've I think you've answered the question, Christian. Uh, just uh, I was just asking how your technology really differs from the Toshiba, and I think you've done right. that. I, I think you're essentially saying it requires no active cooling. Yep. Right. Well, we only have a few minutes left, and I, I want to ask a question to all of you, um, Matt. I don't know whether you've been to Alaska or not, but I know the other two panelists are familiar with Alaska, but. From Matt, you probably know we have great tidal energy resources in Alaska that are so far untapped, but uh, are showing a lot of people are interested in them. So I'm, I'm kind of curious from each one of your perspectives, what do you think the next step is here in Alaska for us to move toward using any of your technologies or, or um, just tapping into the potential of hydrogen and ammonia? What do you think we need to do next to, to move down that road? Wow. Um, I, I know very little about the energy mix in Alaska, but if I was to try and create a parallel with, with what's happened in Orkney and what's happened in other sort of remote um, coastal communities, at least, I know that only a part of Alaska is coastal. I would say exploitation of renewable resource would be the starting point. I mean, it would, it would underpin, I mean, it would, by, by its very nature, would have to underpin any movement towards a green hydrogen industry. Now, I, I know that we're not just talking green hydrogen here, but that would be, yeah, that would be my starting point, whether that be onshore, offshore winds, or whether that be tidal or, or whatever, that, that would be, for me, the first step. Thanks, Matt. Um, Joe? Um, for our technology in particular, uh, really the, the next step is going to be pilot uh, projects, um, and in particular, to demonstrate robustness in the Alaskan en environment. Um, you know, we, a, a full system from us starts, you know, from electrolyzer and, and nitrogen generator and goes through the ammonia process. The ammonia process is actually pretty tolerant to broad range of temperatures. Uh, electrolyzers need water. And uh, so, you know, if you're going to have a modular system, you, you need to make sure you've got the right freeze protection in there. And same with the compressors in the uh, um, nitrogen generation. So there, there's just the, the durability aspect that we would need to work through for the Alaskan environment. Thanks, Joe. Christiane, I think you have the last word here. Uh, for the, for the, what is the next step in the deployment? Yeah, I, what's, I think what's the next step for Alaska, at least? Well, we are engaged with this feasibility study with uh, um, Copper Valley, and that that is our next. And uh, of course, uh, we are of course looking for other opportunities. Why not? And uh, we think that the technology is a fit. And uh, there was a question about the licensing. What is our schedule for licensing? And currently, we are licensing uh, uh, both uh, in Canada and uh, the. The, react, the research test reactor, which is the same exact reactor that we're going to look into build, uh, you know, commercially uh, for the University of Illinois with NRC. So if, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, a commercial request would materialize, I think that uh, the reactor will be deployable by 2026, 2027. That is our timeline. Um, I want just to be sure the answer I gave you before about pass uh, um, passive cooling. What well, the reactor is, of course, uh, is actively cooled during operation. It doesn't need any active cooling during a, a you know off normal condition. It will be right. safe without that. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Christian. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Matt, for joining us. This is a great conversation. Which we could keep talking about. There's a lot to unpack in, in all the presentations you gave. So. Appreciate you all joining us and I'll turn it back over to Aaron. Thank you. Thank you.
presenters, and thank you so much, Chris, for leading that discussion there. Um, as we wrap up, I want to just uh, make sure everyone is still hanging with us. We have one last engagement poll. Um, what is one new or interesting thing you learned today? Um, in a couple words or less, um, you can participate in this poll by typing into your Chrome web browser, pollev.com forward slash T-O-T-T-A-K-216 or text um, as um, instructed there on the screen. I would love to see um, what folks are thinking. Hopefully you're not too tired out from this onslaught of information. Thank you so much for hanging with us. Um, so let's see what uh, folks are putting up here. Again, what is one new or interesting thing that you learned today? Um, storage capacity in Cook Inlet, thank you. Uh, ammonia, um, so many things. You can't keep it down to one. Um, Cook Inlet Coals could store 43 gigatons of CO2. Yes, that was an amazing presentation. Um, it was so wonderful to hear from just the wide variety of, of voices there. As we're looking at um, some of these coming in, um, I just want to recognize sort of the range of material that we covered. We talked about uh, storage and microgrids. Um, we talked about export from stranded resources. Uh, we talked about carbon capture. We switched gears and talked about hydrogen for heat in buildings. Um, and then we just wrapped up with this very interesting um, panel that Chris hosted, hydrogen from tidal, hydrogen from nuclear, uh, and then uh, ammonia production and, and uh, manipulation there. Um, and I, I think we're gonna have more synthesis presentations tomorrow. Um, so I encourage you to please tune in as we start to bring these threads together. We are going to be reviewing um, and, and getting insights on what some of the most compelling use cases are for Alaska. We are going to be thinking about what some of the most urgent research questions are for our state to move us forward. Um, and we'll also be taking stock of um, what advantages and even disadvantages we have up here in terms of engaging um, with hydrogen. So again, wonderful to see these um, awesome responses. Here's a rundown of tomorrow's um, ag ag uh, agenda. Yep, we've got it right there. So please come back at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Again, this has been sponsored by ASEP. And uh, we look forward to seeing you bright and early. Um, have a wonderful afternoon or night or wherever you are. And thank you again for your participation today.